And um, maybe Susan, if you can check and see if there's on the lights. Got it? Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's, that's better. Maybe a little bit more. It's a, it's a great view, although it's kind of a fake view. You look out this window, and you see the reflection. And it's kind of cool, isn't it? So um, I'm unpaid, and I have to go by very strict standards on my presentations that I do. So that's my disclosure. No one's paying me. I'm not getting any money from anyone. I'm not selling anything, not selling anything at all. We're going to talk about, of course, probiotics and the microbiome and evolutionary oral medicine. And you guys know how enthused I am, if you've heard me before, on how we need to understand where we came from. And this is where I'm from. I'm a full professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And I'm also in full-time private practice. I'm the research coordinator for the pediatric dental program at Ann and Robert Laurie Children's. And we do a lot of really good research. Last year, my residents won first place out of 110 institutions for a new way of looking at how fluoride penetrates into cells and into the DNA of cells. We came up with a brand new way using nuclear magnetic resonance, 1.5 Tesla unit, kind of stunning everyone, saying, how can such a clinical program produce such high level research? And we do, because we have a great institution to work at, and we have support from the institution, sort of. So here's our topics, probiotics, diet, prebiotics, evolutionary oral medicine, microbiome, gateway microbiomes. And we've got to start with the gateway microbiomes, because the oral cavity is a gateway microbiome. If you haven't heard about that before, it's because I made it up a couple years ago. No, seriously, at the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska in Stockholm, Sweden because we had, I'll show you pictures about it, we had the big meeting on the microbiome and how it manages everything, and I put in the statement from the Nobel about the importance of the gateway microbiomes. So we're gonna talk about barrier microbiomes, epigenetics, and of course, epitranscriptomics, and all these things that are hard to say, but they're so important. So let's talk about evolutionary oral medicine, how man and microbiome evolves, because we have to talk about that first. The gateway microbiomes, oral, nasal, vaginal, and placental, have evolved to defend the host. And they change. As we change our diet, as we change our climate, as we change our locale, and we don't have time to go into all the different articles on how if you move from here to Minneapolis, your microbiome shifts. Of course it shifts. It has to shift. And it's supposed to shift. And the barrier microbiomes, which don't appear to shift that much, like your skin microbiome, which you've got to leave alone. Those are actually very important commensals that prevent infection. You have to leave your skin alone. And so everything we look at, we should look at from the view of evolution. Because it does actually make sense. It's the only way biology kind of makes sense, except for one thing that really drives me up a wall, is why do kids have 10 upper teeth, 10 lower teeth, 10 fingers, 10 toes? Now it has bothered me. <laughs> why? Why did we evolve to have 10 toes, 10 fingers, 10 upper primary teeth, 10 lower primary teeth? Can you think of any advantageous reason for that, besides developing a decimal system? Seriously, so we've changed a lot. Mankind has changed a lot. Encephalization has increased our cranial size by 300%, right? The brains are much bigger and they continue to grow, which is interesting. We'll talk about that, especially tomorrow, airway, because all this affects airway. And about two, three million years ago, hominins, our predecessors, and then followed by Homo erectus, uh, Homo habilis and all others, started to work as what? Packs to take down big prey and then became tribes. The importance of all that is vocalization. How did those big, giant, saber-toothed tigers that roamed supreme as the massive predator 
suddenly start to disappear as mankind got bigger and stronger and faster because we hunted as packs. It was this energy-dense food, dense nutrient food that helped drive brain development. Changed everything. So encephalization went up a lot, especially if you look at Homo sapiens compared to previous ones. Brain size increased, which means skull had to change, airway had to change, everything's, airway's everything, right? It's airway not just sleeping, but all day. All that occurs because of the encephalization that was occurring, because we suddenly, suddenly had, especially after cooking, we had the ability to digest food with a smaller gut. Our livers got smaller, the guts got smaller, which meant what? We got faster. We could run faster. We became the predator, and we still are the predator. So if you look at the change that allowed more brain development, that's what happened. Cooking made that go much faster. Homo erectus and cooking. Cooking meat makes it break down easier, better, you can actually eat it longer. All sorts of things develop because of fire, the advent of fire, including a lot of our airway. So we do know how things were because we have, as you've heard me talk about before, we had calculus. And from calculus, that preserves all the DNA that's in the biofilm and in the diet. So we can look at what has transformed over the time, especially going from the Neolithic Revolution about 10, 12,000 years ago to the Industrial Revolution, 1840s, 1850s, how we had big microbiome shifts. And these were not good shifts. We went from hunter-gatherer to being people who were staying in one area, being agriculturalists, and the amount of disease went up quite a bit. So we stopped being hunter-gatherers. We went to Walmart instead. That's not hunting-gathering. Because although it appears there's a good amount of variety there. There really isn't a lot of variety there. Those watermelons are the same at Walmart as they are the Walmart 10 miles away as the other Walmart 10 miles further away. But in the cave of skulls, you saw that when they looked at all the berries, the DNA from the berries, that there were a huge amount of variety of different berries because you went bush to bush to bush and they were all slightly different varieties, which led to great gut Diversity. Losing the gut diversity has resolved with all sorts of issues with obesity. Yeah? Scary slide. Sorry about that. And we used to get better exercise as hunter-gatherers because we used to move around. Now, there was less work because hunter-gatherers could actually gather what they needed in far fewer hours in a week as they moved through the area just basically scavenging, eating everything they could find getting together packs, bringing down big animals. So the modern pathogens that we have have all been fed on by the diet high in carbohydrates. You guys all know this. I mean, you've heard this a hundred times before. Less diversity, I know it's hard to see the slide, but on the far right, you can see the big increase in porphyromonas gingivalis, especially then in strep mutans. The important thing to realize about periopathogens, though, is that they've been with us for a very, very, very long time. They are the epitome of a parasite because they don't kill you right away. They kill you slowly. And so you can continue with perio disease, you can continue with heart disease, and you can spread it to the rest of the tribe. The ideal pathogen. It doesn't kill you right away. You'll later get Alzheimer's, so oral hygiene becomes less important to you. It is the ideal pathogen. Now, there are cases of caries that have been found, like in Homo rudisiensis down in Zimbabwe, when they found areas where there's a lot of decay. But there was also a very large amount of fruit, I'm sorry, honey available. There was a large amount of honey available. And that had increased brain size, too, they postulate. I'm skipping a lot of articles that were reference articles because of time. They feel that increased a lot of the brain size expansion, having that high energy dense honey that helped us develop, but it came at a price like everything always does. The biggest increases came though later on during civilization and as we went to the Iron Age and Roman era, Bronze Age, all those as we became more and more modern, 
we got more and more pathogens, more and more caries, except for in the very early medieval times. Now, you've seen my presentation before I show you the slides why that happened during the early medieval. A lot of hunting-gatherer type groups, like the Vikings, became part of society. And they brought with them their type of diet, which was a varied diet, extremely. Vikings would eat anything, and they were hunter-gatherers. I mean, they, they, they farm, but they like to raid, mostly. So if you look at what has happened, and this slide is beautiful because it shows from the Mesolithic to Neolithic and medieval to modern, how the genera changed. Look at the change in the colors. I think it's a beautiful slide because as we change our diet, we change our microbiome. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because being forced to eat wheat meant we greatly increased the amount of bacteria that break down gluten for us. It's a bad thing because if you lose those bacteria, what happens? You become gluten intolerant. So we're really at an era where the bacteria are controlling us more than we realize. Not just in what we do because they control our behavior, but also what we eat and what we crave, right? You've seen all those articles out there. So what happened was it was such a big thing going from Mesolithic to Neolithic the average height for men went from 5'10 down to 5'5, five five, and from women from 5'6 down to 5'1. And they can look at all the skeletal remains and say, look at all the additional issues, caries, arthritis. It was a high price we paid for civilization, a very high price to become civilized. And of course, the great increase in dental pathologies was what? That's our early warning system. That's the canary in the coal mine saying, guys, what are you doing? But if we hadn't done that, there'd been no great pyramids. There'd been no mathematics. It, it was important. It was a sacrifice. And now that we know this, we can work to try to correct this with prebiotics and probiotics, right? I love reading about the Natufians about 1,200, I'm sorry, 12,000 to 500 years ago and 10,000 to 200 years ago. Natufians were kind of a group of people that were horticulturalists. And they were kind of hunter-gatherers, but they liked to stay in certain areas. And they had a big variety of food, wheat, barley, almonds, gazelle, deer, cattle, horse, wild boar, delicious. And so going on, what we find with them is that they started to stay in one area. They started to stay in one area because they liked what was growing there. And they started to hunt and stay there more and more. And this was a, from a series of events. It didn't happen all at once. The series of events, so they would stay in the area, they would eat all this stuff, so they had the true paleo diet, but they started to stay for one very, very important reason. This is a guess. They think it was because of feasting and making beer. So if you heard this before, beer is a reason we have civilization. <laughs> Big game is a reason we have society. You can't bring down a giant mastodon unless there's 20 or 30 of you working together. And that requires vocalization, communication, outthinking, trapping, finding them, finding a way to like surround them. Now, there's a lot of primates that kind of do that already. They use groups and they do things as a group. But homo, the hominins, we took it to a fine art. So they made, stayed in the area just to brew beer. And as everyone here knows, brew, the beer has recovered a lot since prohibition. We're now at the point that we have more breweries than we did before Prohibition, which means we're now more civilized. Absolutely, substantially more civilized. And the most important thing about it is we now finally have jobs for all the Natufians in our society. <laughs> you just go to any microbrewery, you can find the Natufians finally have work. And I think that's wonderful. I always like to say, hey, Natufian, may I have one of those IPAs? <laughs> so again, you know, DNA is preserved in the dental calculus, which is wonderful. Now these are, I, I show you the article. This is published in Journal of Human Evolution. And you see the actual article. And I'm required to do that. And I have cut a few out because of time. 
But you, normally you'll see the actual article. So if you want to like use it as a reference, please do. And I will quote the article, okay, whenever possible. It's an absolute book. I always say thank God we didn't have dental hygienists back then because all that calculus would be gone. You know, long before the person would die, they'd be all scraped off. And then I get corrected by all the hygienists saying you're absolutely wrong. There's always been dental hygienists. They always had their special sickle scalers and wore their protective uniforms as they scaled. You know, that's the dental hygienist of before. Okay, yeah. So pathogens, and we did mention that perio has been around. If you look at the ancient oral cavity that's published in Nature Genetics, these are all wonderful dental journals. Get a chance to read some real good dental journals like Nature Genetics, Investigative Genetics, uh, Personalized Genomics, a Journal of a Clinical Applied Microbiology, or a Journal of en Environmental Microbiology. You'll be stunned how many articles are written on dentistry, but not in dental journals. You don't find this in the ADA journal, okay? Pathogens have been with us for a very, very long time. Tanarella forsythia goes all the way back, 239 other bacteria they found. And so all these show that we've been dealing with perio for a very, very, very long time. Very long time. Now the thing is, is that as we have evolved, so has our microbiome. And they co-speciated from about seven million years ago where we had like a common ancestry microbiome. And so that now Homo sapiens has one, a completely distinct microbiome totally from any other type of primate. And this is really important because I even went several years ago, we were trying to look at the true paleo microbiome, thinking we could find it in some primates that we we're working with in Brazil. No, nothing similar whatsoever in microbiomes. And this co-speciation, like I said, really took off about seven million years ago, but for the past 15 million years, there's been this thing going on between us and our microbiome. And that's why we have all these ancient symbionts. You know, I notice the screen colors are off significantly from what I show, so I apologize for that. That must be the way the projector is set. That's probably the original projector put in here, what, 15, 20 years ago when they built it? Yeah, the colors are definitely not the same. So anyway, we have this distinct microbiome. And what's interesting about that is, is the microbiome that drives evolution. I'm sure you've heard this before. How we evolve, how plants evolve, how animals evolve is your microbiome. So what you do to change your microbiome changes evolution, right? So we're gonna look different in a very short period of time because it's going extremely fast. So evolution is changing us very quickly. Microbes, that's a whole genome concept, drives evolution. And that's because we're a holobiont. We're the combination of ourself and all of our symbionts. So we have our own genome, then we have the genome of the microbiome, and together it makes a hologenome. We don't live in a vacuum. You kill off a very important species of bacteria, within a very short period of time, it's replaced by something else, and that's gonna change our evolution. So it's kind of frightening. We have to be so careful with things. So like it or not, microbiology is gonna be the center of evolutionary study in the future, and vice versa. So everything, after all, dental disease is what? Dysbiosis involves microorganisms, so that's what we're dealing with. So that's because of horizontal gene transfer, lateral gene transfer, where genes are passed back and forth by bacteria, plasmids. They're finding out all these really fascinating things. In fact, this tree of life has completely, utterly changed. You guys know about the archaea. And now, just like the past couple weeks, a bunch of new articles on archaea and disease. Because the archaea affect what? Their mitochondria. Mitochondrial health is driven by archaea. What? I mean, we knew Porphyrmonas gingivalis did it, but the archaea, who we didn't even know existed a couple decades ago, right, are driving mitochondrial health. 
We'll talk about that more. And of course, GMOs, that makes GMOs even scarier. I was not ever worried about GMO because I always figured my kids were genetically modified anyway. Having genes from me and my wife, I go, oh, hey, you're a GMO. I'm not worried about feeding you GMO. You're modified. Okay. So tubers, and we'll get out evolutionary oral medicine shortly, more into probiotics. Tubers were very, very important in our development. And when we couldn't get game, couldn't find anything growing on trees, early humans in Africa would dig up tubers, big underground storage organisms. And they would eat them and use a stick, which required what? Development of intelligence. And again, some of these are really big. It took several people digging at the same time to pull up a tuber. What is important about this is it modified our teeth. So as you all know, humans have the most specific dentition of any animal. Our dentition is completely different, the way it's designed, just like our brains are completely different. What other animal has rosehip neurons? Rosehip neurons are only in Homo sapiens. They're trying to see if they can find any evidence of rosehips in earlier. They think some of the hominins had some precursors to rosehips. But the rosehip neuron is what drives our intelligence. That's what makes someone in the back there be a great musician. Okay. That's what makes you think abstract thought. That's how you use reverse logic. All this is because of rosehip neurons. So the thing about this is cooking, again, comes up as being very important. Some person sitting in a fire to keep the predators away, and we'll talk about that with sleep tomorrow, because fires are very important for allowing us to develop how we are when we sleep was a discovery of fire, that fire cooked some food for them and they ate it. And they said, hey, that's pretty good. Okay. So the thing about tubers is polyols. Because tubers are full of polyols, sugar alcohols, mannitol, sorbitol, inositol, ribitol, xylitol, all that is found in tubers. And it was a mainstay of early man in Africa. Now, there's a couple of really important things on those giant tubers. Those are a picture of tubers as they used to be like in Africa. They're huge, and they could feed a small tribe, two of them, for a while. Is when you look at the difference in the gut between EU kids and kids growing up in rural Africa, the Burkina Faso area, you look at their microbiota, the microbiota is significantly different. And one of the most important thing is the depletion of Prevotella and Xanlibacter. We don't have Xanlibacter. We could look at everybody in this whole room and you won't have any Xanlibacter, but if you go to rural South America, you go to rural Africa, they still have Xanlibacter to break down xylose. It's the outside of plants. The worst thing we ever did was make peelers, vegetable peelers, to peel away the outside. Because that's loaded with xylose, which is completely important. We need to have that. So we don't have that. They have it. We don't because of what we eat. One of the most important things out of this, and we'll talk about this with things like athletes, is that what Xylobacter, Prevotella, Bretera Vibrio, and all these treponema do is they allow you to extract calories from otherwise indigestible fiber. That's really important if you're surviving on very little, right? You can actually eat stuff and have calories from it hours later. And I'll show you some articles on athletes. Guess who have these? Runners. Extreme athletes like Spartan runners actually can break down and get calories hours later from that carb diet they had that you can't get. That's why they can run and run and run. Yeah, and there's other bacteria too, like the lactic acid digesting bacteria that athletes have that most of us in this room don't have any of at all, which is an unfair advantage, right? And they produce short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, and butyrate is a very strong anti inflammatory. And what's butyrate good for? Protecting your mitochondria. So they don't have mitochondrial disease. The rate of autism is extremely low. All these diseases, all these autoimmune diseases, it's extremely low. Of course, they have other diseases because they don't have modern health care. 
But on the other hand, they're protected from the chronic immune diseases. And all this stuff is timing sensitive. So it's really interesting because that's how people survived. We're looking at how people survived. You had to bring down an animal that was much stronger than you were. So you had to develop tools and the diet had to change. The odd thing is, again, if you were to look at athletes, their guts are completely different. And we'll show you a lot of the articles on this later, so you know I'm not making this up. They have a completely different gut, different type of short chain fatty acids, and he can eat a meal, and eight hours later, he's still pumping out calories in the large intestine from that meal. Yeah, not you, buddy. <laughs> ah, not you, not me either. You know, it doesn't happen that way. Okay, so again, completely different gut, and you can see up here in the green, you got your xylenobacter right here, big amount of it right here, 20% of all your bacteria is up there to break down xylane and xylose and make xylitol for you and all this other good stuff. And down here you find you don't have any of that in the kids from the European Union. Of course not. Of course not. Modern diet, right? So this is all very important because this is all part of the old friend hypothesis. How do we protect kids? They have to get the right microbiome. You know, in rural areas like rural Cuba, they still have the right microbiome. That's what appears. So they're much healthier. And I'll tell you about one of our IRB approved studies we have going on where we're going into rural Cuba and looking at these kids and comparing them to their second cousins who live in Florida and they're completely different. So I'll let you know about that research we're doing right now. So when does this protection begin? Well, as we all now know, it begins in utero, right? It begins at the very beginning. Placental microbiome is a gateway microbiome. Now, we had a big argument two years, actually three years ago, at the Nobel Forum, where there was people saying, you can't have placental microbiome. And they said, but we find them. You look at a placenta, it's there. If you look at that very infamous study that was done and published in the Journal of Anatomy, where they looked at aborted fetuses, and they found that all of them had a microbiome. Okay, so they had, they had a microbiome that was distinct, related to the parent, the mother. So you look at this microbiome that's there, and it comes from the mom. It has to come from the mom. So this is work of Kirsty Argard. She is a phenomenal person, and I, I, I'm trying to get her to be an AOSH speaker down the road. And hopefully at one of our AOSH meetings, we can have Kirsty speak, because she is phenomenal. And so, uh, anyway, she was the one who looked and found that the placental microbiome is most similar to another gateway microbiome, the oral microbiome. That's not accidental. Of course that's not accidental. That's the way it developed. It's not the vaginal microbiome, it's not the gut microbiome, but the similarity is between the oral and the placental. Here's the placental, here's the oral microbiome. That's the similarity. So what develops the placental microbiome, what develops the fetal microbiome, which develops the baby for most of their life, it has an influence on their development, during fetal development, as an early, early uh, time before it starts to shift due to the environment, that is so important. And that is the oral microbiome. That's why we have to work early on. Placental microbiome is distinct, but related to the oral microbiome. And the most important thing is Preterm kids are different. They're different because that microbiome is continued to develop in the placenta. It changes over time. And as you know from a lot of the autism research, they show that there's a negative change in those placentas before birth with you know, the propionic bacteria taking over, producing lots of propionic acid, which then has a very negative effect on the developing child. It is so unfair that this goes on. And one of the big reasons is because of antibiotics. Antibiotics are one of the big things. The history of antibiotics is often the reason they see a shift. Now, it's a history of antibiotics that is quite a little bit beforehand. It could be three years before, four years before. It could be for any reason, um, you know, a strep throat in a mom, an ear infection. A, I love when people call me during a lecture here. Oh, well. So, 
it's, it's really interesting because it could be bacterial vaginosis, so on, which seems to be one of the big indicators for this use of antibiotics that then end up changing how the placental microbiome develops. And of course, diet. And I'll show you some slides on McDonald's. What did McDonald's do uh, about three weeks ago? It was in the news. McDonald's did something big three weeks ago. I want to have a winner. You get a free box of Probiora. Come on. What? They removed the preservatives in all but their relish. They removed calcium propanate, which is linked to autism. It was a big thing in Forbes. McDonald's pulling out because of all the grief they're getting from the autism researchers, saying, you're using a preservative that is strongly linked to autism. Stop doing it. And they finally caved three weeks ago. Go look it up. Look it up. Look at the Forbes article. Look at Forbes and so on. Okay, who won? <laughs> this guy, he's been to my lectures before. Thank you. So, yeah, you got it. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. So anyway, that was a big thing. I was so excited about that. I have to show you one of my McDonald's experiments, too. So we change our microbiome by what we eat, by antibiotics, by diet, by medication, by exercise. If you did nothing in your diet but just start exercising your microbiome shifts, isn't that fantastic? Just that alone shifts your microbiome. Why? Shift. Your energy requirements have changed. All this stuff is just straight, it's just straightforward logical. Disinfectants, oh my God. Uh, just a few weeks ago, again, a paper came out, you know, AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, is saying, what about disinfectants? Don't use them in your home. I'll show you the article, okay. The hygiene hypothesis. So that was the take home that was supposed to be for that probiora. We all have dys dysbiosis. When you go home, remember this, all of us have dysbiosis. I do, you do. I can't help it, people bring donuts in in the morning. I am a sugar addict, and we'll talk about that. I am a sugar addict. I try so hard not to eat sugar, and then someone brings in these really delicious donuts and stuff like that. It's addictive. All of us have a problem, and everything is changing. That's an important take home, remember that. There's not a patient who doesn't need some type of intervention. We all need intervention, ourselves included, absolutely. So things have evolved, right? And one of the most important things we have to ask about, what came first, chicken or the egg? Have never gotten a good answer to that, by the way. Think about it, I've never actually had a good answer to that. But eggs have evolved for over 360 million years, right? So that's what has happened to the dinosaur. They became more delicious for us. I don't know. I've never had dinosaur meat. It might be good barbecued. Who knows? But what have we done to eggs? Now, the United States is unique in about four countries, right? There's, a, there's this little thing about the United States and three other countries all the time, like with Diet Coke and all that, which we'll talk about. But we started to mess up eggs really bad. It didn't take Chevy Chase to do it. It took our Department of Agriculture to say that eggs need to be washed, right? Can't sell them in a grocery store without washing eggs. This is tragic, and this is published in Public Library Science and One, you know, a couple years ago, that when eggs are hatched or where they're, and the hen lays the egg, it has a specific microbiome on top of that egg shell to protect the eggshell that has developed over hundreds of millions of years. And all of a sudden, we get smarter than nature, right? right? We're so much smarter than nature. It's just so ridiculous. But they have this very specific microbiome. That's why in Europe, you go to any grocery store in Europe, where's the eggs? Sitting out there in the open, unrefrigerated. As my son would say, he went to school and did, got his degree in, uh, undergrad degree in Paris, and he's my youngest son, and he's doing his graduate degree right now at uh, King's College in theoretical mathematics. Uh, you just go into a French grocery store and the egg's sitting there with a couple feathers and some poop still on it. You know it's good. <laughs> That's a good egg, right? So we kind of ruined that. And there's a lot of articles on this. I mean, these are pretty, like, this is ecology evolution. 
that the reason this evolved, that was a strategy to control embryo survival. Eggs have a microbiome that's unique to protect the eggs. They last for months without refrigeration, but not in the United States because we have to wash the eggs, right? Which is crazy. So if you go to babies, I sure wish this was a better projector. Unfortunately, it's not. If you go to babies, you look at this little thing, you think, well, this baby's got to be so, you know, oh, so defenseless and so weak, and I have to really protect this little baby. You wouldn't be here today if we were that weak. How did they survive 150 years ago on a wagon train having a baby? Or the Native Americans having a baby and walking an hour later? How did they survive? Babies aren't that way. They have a distinct microbiome. They're born with a protective microbiome. It changes as they're being born, as they go through the birth canal, granted, as they start to breathe, it changes. But they're more like this. <laughs> they're pretty tough little boogers, okay? That's how babies really are, okay? So we gotta get away from all this has to be done this way or this way nonsense. So on your left, you see what we do to eggs, high temperature sodium hypochlorite disinfection. But not the rest of the world. It's only in the United States, Sweden, and they only did because we did. Australia and Japan are the only countries that do that. Australia because they had a salmonella outbreak. But you know, if you just look at free range eggs, they are so much healthier for you. You know where I get my eggs? I go to this farmer. And his daughter runs out to the chicken coop and she puts it in her t-shirts like this. She brings in these fresh eggs. They are so good. So much better for you. The omega-3s are so much higher. Everything's higher. Eggs are good food. But we have somehow destroyed eggs. We decided to turn them to other things. I, I love this picture. Should I run for it? <laughs> Go, kid, run! Run, kid, he'll never catch you. In a million years, you're off free. Don't you hate seeing that? You walk around and you're at the TSA and there's a person who's, I'm short. There's a person shorter than me that weighs 100 pounds more. I'm going like, you're supposed to protect me from a terrorist? I can outrun you so fast for so long. And so anyway, why did this happen? We all know why the police officers got fat, right? We all know. Donuts. You go to the donut place, you always see police officers there having their donuts. That's why. That will do it to you. But now what we have done is we've done it to our kids. Our kids and donuts. We're changing the food, and that's really bad because I don't know if you saw this article that came out, Act of Pediatrica. Six years of age, a significant percentage of six-year-old children have shown abnormal metabolic profiles. And the American Academy of Pediatrics said, oh, my God, we're going to have diabetes in all of our teenagers soon if this keeps up. And this is because of the massive amount of sugar. Now, you know, of course, I'm a member of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm a diplomate and all that good stuff and fellow. But <clears throat> we used to worry about that. When I took my boards back in the early 80s, one of the things we had to do is show a diet summary. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. We had to show that we did diet counseling. We had posters up about sugar. It was required to do diet counseling. It became unimportant. And that really bothers me. We used to care a lot about prebiotics. We used to care about this stuff. Now, we all know that, of course, sugar is linked to decay, right? Changes in the oral microbiome because you feed the wrong bacteria. You're feeding the pathogens. They can overcompete them with the, the actual probiotics you have, which is why we're, we're talking about probiotics, because you have to supplement those guys. And then we go in sometimes to oral hygiene practices that are antimicrobial to everything, and yet we still have the sugar intake, which helps the pathogens come back faster. It doesn't make any sense. We need far, far more prebiotics in our diet and far less carbs. This is a great paper published in the Journal of Dental Research about three and a half, four years ago, Effect of Carries on Restricting Sugars Intake. Should be required reading in every dental school. You get decay because you eat sugar. That's why. And it's a very good article. 
Um, what is the reason for decay? It's sugar. And we also know that because during war rationing, like World War II and World War I, the caries rate dropped significantly everywhere. Every country knew this. The cavity rate was dropping like a rock because you couldn't get the sugar to feed the pathogens that you had, the strep mutans. And in occupied countries where the Nazis were taking, like in Norway, where they were taking all the high value food for themselves and people had to live on nothing but potatoes, guess what happened? The cardiovascular death rate dropped like a rock. Now think about this. You're under a very high stress situation where you don't know if the next door Quisling is going to turn you in to the Gestapo and hang you off of a lamppost, as an example, but the heart attack rate dropped <laughs> because of lack of sugar and some other foods too. But the main thing is restricted diet, restricted calories, fasting is good for you. Everyone here knows you gotta fast on a periodic basis, fast, just don't eat. And not eating for long periods of time every day is great. You should skip a meal. Everything that we were told as kids, all of it's wrong, right? You guys all know, never eat a balanced meal. You're never supposed to eat a balanced meal. You're supposed to eat a meal that's one way and a meal that's another way. I could tell you many stories about the research on that, but it's really fascinating. You don't eat balanced meals. But what happened is, and this was three days after the Japanese signed a surrender on top of, what was that, the USS Iowa or Missouri? USS Missouri? Missouri, Missouri okay. Three days after the Japanese surrendered, the sugar industry was already quickly, because he knew rationing was going to end, started this massive campaign. You guys have all heard about this with Ansel Keys and everyone else to look at metabolism of sugar and show it was okay. And that's what they got done. There's the thing. Since a three-year FDA uh, study, government gives sugar a clean bill of health. Sugar does not cause obesity. Sugar does not cause disease. Sugar is actually good for you. It's a nutrient. My mom, my poor mom, took a candy that was supposed to be a diet aid. You guys remember that? AYD? That chocolate candy was supposed to make you lose weight. It's a chocolate high sugar candy because it was supposed to knock your appetite out so you wouldn't eat. You guys remember that candy? Oh, yeah, it was a big seller to lose weight. And of course, how about dental health? Dental health was a big thing. But now we know from USCSF that there's sugar papers out there. And Dr. Robert Lustig, we're going to talk about. He, he has, he's a great speaker. How many people have heard Dr. Lustig? I want you guys all to hear Dr. Lustig. We hope to have him be an AO speaker. He's wonderful. He really talks about the sugar papers and everything. So they shifted the national interest toward fats, not sugar, that it was all due to fats. Fats cause disease, not sugar. Not sugar for dental disease. You got dental disease because you didn't have enough fluoride. And now they have, they say they have fluoride papers showing how the money went from the sugar industry to help support big pushes on fluoride. Because that was supposed to make up for the sugar. That was the whole idea. Eat all the sugar you want because you have fluoride. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a very big skeptic that things like that went on until you see the actual papers that have been out. And then you see this ad. How many people have seen this ad on TV all the time? Just before uh, good old, uh, oh, it's not, there we go. The Crest commercial. They're offering kids good food. How many people have seen this? Come on, y'all have, right? They're offering kids good food. And I'm sorry you can't hear it well because the speaker sat up. But they're offering them like broccoli. My kids love broccoli. They're offering them all these good things. The kids are going, yuck, that's disgusting. And he's asking, you don't want to eat it? And they go, no, I'm not going to eat that. That's horrible. I want candy. Give me candy. I definitely want to have candy. That's what I want to have is candy. And this is the, the Crest commercial. And it's really interesting because this used to be Crest commercials right there. That used to be Crest. This is the current Crest. Bring on the candy. Crest has you covered. Haven't you seen these billboards everywhere? Isn't that disgusting? You spend your professional career trying to help people, trying to help them with their health, trying to prevent dental disease, and Crest. 
You think I have crest in my office? No. No. Absolutely, totally not. They can try to give it to me, I give it back. That upsets me. We, could, we spend hours on toothpaste, by the way, and where they're now made, and what's really in them now, and stuff like that. You guys know where the, the vast majority aren't made here, right? You know where they're made and all that stuff, and where the components come from. It's really disgusting what's going on. Hey, by the way, did you check? I, I have pictures I didn't put in here because of time. I'm so worried about time. But there's, we, we did a, a candy buyback again, and we do it for research purposes, and we actually look at all the expiration dates on the candy, and we'll look at those little codes and look them up. Some of the candy we just got in expired 2015. Yeah, people are recycling. They're recycling candy. What they get in one year, they give out the next year, then the next door neighbor does the same thing, so candy keeps circling around, okay? That's how disgusting things are. And have you tried a, a Reese's peanut butter cup recently? They're gross. I can remember I first had a Reese's peanut, peanut butter cup, for real, in college. And I shared a package with this very attractive young lady. She and I were working at a theater together, up the mezzanine by the, ourselves, talking about stuff and sharing this container of Reese's peanut butter cups I'd never had before. It's, it's, it's really a spiritual moment for me. <laughs> it's a memory I'm not ever going to let go. <laughs> maybe it was the company, maybe it was the candy, but it was, it was awesome. So anyway, um, candy sales are going up and up and up and up because Crest is winning. They're convincing people it's okay to do this. And you know, when you ask people about what are you gonna do with all this candy, they say it's absolutely fine because we donate it to the homeless. <laughs> oh my God, are they clueless? Or we donate it to uh, uh, the hospitals to give to the oncology patients. And then you tell them, well, you realize a ketogenic diet usually increases the effectiveness, which we don't have time to go on all these articles, of chemotherapy by 35%. And you're just negating that ketogenic diet completely, right? So you're killing that person you know, by giving them. That's why a lot of hospitals don't allow candy now in oncology because it completely negates chemotherapy. So they're totally home. They're totally clueless on this. Now, an important thing on that, Article 2 was the fact that I think most people here probably know that fluoride delays decay. You know, it works on remineralization, the outside layer of the, t of the tooth only, right? Fluorapatite forms on the outside, very outside layer. And fluoride works by delaying decay. And it, what it does is it takes the decay you would have gotten from 0 to 10 years of age and pushes it to 10 to 20 years of age. Decay from 0 to 20 years of age pushes it to 20 to 40 years of age. And this is all well documented. It pushes it back, pushes it back, pushes it back. Which is okay if you don't live that long. Okay, this is a problem with all these 5-year studies and 10-year studies. As they know, fluoride delays decay. Eventually, the person pays for it down the road. Eventually, there is still a problem perio or you know, other things, but that's why adults end up having so much dental care. So if you look at fluoride in the water, this was just published literally a couple months ago and reiterated by the ADA. They sent it out to everyone saying, we don't have to worry, we have fluoride in the water. So on a, like a teenager or an adolescent, fluoride reduces cavity rate. This is a very good study done you know, in the NHANE study, right? heavily published everywhere reduces cavities in those kids by 12%. Little kids by 30%. Okay. And they didn't talk about older on, later in, in life, because the, the, it keeps dropping, the effectiveness as you get older. Right? These are important things to realize because you can't depend on fluoride. It's absolutely silly. So people say to you, why, why are you such a gloomy person? You know, look at the benefits. I go, it is important. It reduces the cavities by a million. I mean, it's huge. But 12%, 12%. Okay, I'm going to go to Yard House, and I'm going to buy Susan Maples a beer. And, and anytime, anytime, says them. And they're going to fill it 12%. Am I going to be happy with that result? Um, Susan, if one of your kids came home, and they say, hey, Look, mom, I got 12% on my exam. <laughs> Why do they get mad at me for pointing that out? All that means is we have a lot more work to do, and probiotics is one very important way of doing it. Tooth brushing, they made a big deal. Well, you're not brushing enough. If you brush twice a day, that's it. And of course, flossing once a day, 
once every other day, doesn't have any benefit to brush three times a day in studies. Doesn't change that much to brush three times a day. You could, you could go home and brush four times a day. It's not going to change that much, statistically. Okay. But what is really interesting out of this, another great JDR article, is the fact that a lot of these benefits are there independent of fluoride. When they look at the studies, a lot of it has to do with diet, social economic groups, and that actually explains a lot of it. Get rid of the sugar, period, and you'll be in much better shape. Now, that's why for decades, you guys all know this NHANE stuff, there was no progress at all in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on, up until like a year or two ago, there was no progress in the caries rate of kids, zero. Why are we happy with that? I wouldn't be happy with that. And in fact, if you look at adults, and this, I'll tell you where this data comes from, 98% of non-Hispanic whites have dental disease from caries, right? 98%. 40% of blacks have, over the age of 65, have unfilled, restor uh, unfilled caries, unrestored caries. This comes from the Centers for Disease Control. This stuff isn't made up. So has dentistry done a great job? No. It's done okay. Um, D plus, maybe. Sealants. So sealants is another way, and I have to tell you, we had a presentation done by a guy who does all the data for 79 different insurance policies, big plans. And he looked at sealants, and they came up with the data because they followed these people for like a decade too. Sealants also, although they're great, I, I love sealants in kids because they delay decay. They delay decay. Sometimes, if you get that child to the point that they're really good about diet and everything, you don't have to worry about it. But it's not a guarantee. Insurance people will tell you, yeah, we like them because they found out in their actuarial tables that you pay for a sealant on that patient, they would, the insurance company, by the time it has failed and there's some caries starting up later, then they have another insurance company that has to pay for it. That's why they like it. Isn't that crazy? It gives them an uh, economic advantage in their actual, actual tables. So what does the ADA do? Maybe they don't like me speaking because of things like this. Did you guys get from the ADA a few weeks ago, like three or four weeks ago, healthy, mouth healthy, life stages, six ways to reduce your child's sugary snacking? They talked about sugar. They did. Thank them for doing that. They mentioned how much sugar kids get. You know, children should get more than three teaspoons a day. And that's only 12 grams. And then they go on to say uh, a can of soda is 20 grams. I go, seriously? A can of soda is 20 grams? Where have they been? Kids drink a 16 ounce one, that's 52 grams of sugar. We get way too much sugar. 20 ounces, 65 grams of sugar. That's what kids are really getting. Not that data from 20, 30 years ago. But what really upset me about this whole thing is there was no suggestions and no comments about health. Did you read it? You guys, go back, look at your emails you got. There was nothing as a suggestion. It just said six ways. I go, where are the six ways? Now, as you'll see in, in pictures, I've raised five kids. Okay, three boys, two girls. Okay. There are things they can have for snacks. Granted, my, young, my oldest was young, we didn't have all this stuff, and the diet changed as time went on, but there are fruits and vegetables, and my kids love their broccoli growing up. They love their carrots growing up, and the celery, and the cheese. We got real cheese, too. I went out of the way to get real cheese, not fake cheese, because pretty soon I understood, well, there's a really big difference in the taste of these cheeses. I got really more developed, my own palate. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know, good grass-fed milk from cows. Cows are grass-fed, not sugar juice and so on. Real beef jerky. You know, my argument to parents all the time, who buys the groceries, your four-year-old? When did they get their license? When did they get their credit card? Okay, They go buy the groceries? Who buys the groceries? If you buy the groceries, it shouldn't be in the house. 
That plain and simple. It's like that Halloween study that was done on leftover Halloween candy. A lot of it's consumed by the parents who are overweight, metabolic syndrome. And the candy's sitting there and they can't say no to it. They start eating all of it when the kids are at school. Yeah, isn't that scary? Oh wait, I see some guilty faces out there. I see a lot of guilty faces. What are you guys doing? I see those guilty faces. But as time has gone on, things have gotten better for us because we now know about you know, trying to go non-GMO. I made jokes about we have xylitol. The ADA did not mention xylitol. It didn't mention healthy snacks. It didn't mention probiotics. Not one thing that was useful was mentioned. Whole Foods. We have Whole Foods now, right? We can go to Whole Foods. We have things. And of course, I mentioned Robert Lustig. Please, you know, if, we get, if Lustig becomes a speaker, I'd be wonderful. I'm all for it. He's a wonderful speaker. You've listened to him. He's a, a professor of pediatrics, division endocrinology, and at uh, University of California, San Francisco, where I have a number of friends that he's authored a lot of papers. 80% of our food, commercial food we get, have added sugar. The so sugar is, is the anti-prebiotic. That's what we're talking about. Sugar is the anti-prebiotic that you can have. Uh, don't sugarcoat it, like Dr. Phil says, because you'll probably eat it. Another famous doctor talking about it, you're fat. So I got to tell you, this is John Youngkin's book on pure, white, and deadly. So I sent a copy to my oldest daughter. And you know, she's a psychologist. She's very bright. You know, straight A student throughout Northwestern, Dean's List, and all this stuff like this. And so she sends me back a picture. Grandson Henry, first birthday, and here we go. <laughs> he is so cute. And, but Lustig explains this, that for kids, sugar is processed, the fructose, in the liver the same way that alcohol is processed in adults. It all made sense to me, because I remember all these crazy birthday parties with all this crazy candy, and the kids going crazy acting like they're drunk. It all makes sense to me now, right? So I'm going to try to have things different for grandson. Now we have obesity because of all this, and now obesity is terrible, right? And the United States was winning. We're not anymore, thank God. We're losing to other countries. Yes! We didn't win the gold. We're just going to go in for the bronze on obesity, which is perfectly fine to me. Uh, it's skyrocketing a lot. This, these are old data. Right now, China's like this, you know. It, it's incredible. I was talking to a neonatologist at University of Chicago, and she was telling about her last, she's from China, and she went back to China, and she says, oh my God, all the kids are getting fat. They're all getting diabetes because they have now McDonald's everywhere, right? They have all these bad things. And of course, there's people say, hey, you don't have to worry about all this because we're going to legalize marijuana. And everyone knows that legalization of marijuana is going to solve all of our ills. We just won't care about our ills, right? <laughs> Man, it was a tough day. <sighs> yeah, it was. Right, Chris? <sighs> tough day, Chris. And so, you know, the problem is someone will find a way to deep fat fry it, for sure. You know. I have to tell you a story. I, I'm sorry. I'm just having fun. You know, I, I get up, I talk, I have fun. You guys know I have all sorts of fun with this stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lecture in... Good old Amsterdam. I'm with two of my kids. We go into a coffee shop. I can't laugh because I see a marijuana plant in the corner. We sit down. We have some coffee. We just say, hey, those brownies look really good. So I order some brownies. I can't believe I did that. I mean, I had no concept at all. I order those brownies think, hey, it's a coffee shop, right? So my like, kids and I, my two oldest, were having the brownies. We're walking around. And then all of a sudden, my daughter goes, dad? I go, yeah. I'm feeling a little high. I'm going to like, come to think of it, so am I. <laughs> and so we walk around, you know, walk and walk and try and get it out. We weren't driving. Come on, it's legal there. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think it's going to solve all of our ills, but yeah, we felt good. So uh, hey, that's a, hey, you know, it's a, it's a father, daughter, son thing, OK? You have to do that at some time. So you look at Mexico. And in Mexico, the average eight-year-old child has had more sugar than their grandparents had in their lifetime. Obesity rate. This is from the Mexican government in 2012, so it's probably an underestimate. 73% of Mexican adult females. By the way, instead of that green, that's supposed to be yellow. Right here on my screen, that's yellow. Up there, it's green. But anyway, look at the rates 
Of women of childbearing potential, 73% are overweight or obese. That's unbelievable. And a lot of it has to do with the high sugar content in all their drinks. You know? And they drink a lot of things that have very high sugar content. And they eat a lot of food that has a lot of sugar in it. They really do. And by the way, in the contest, uh, Coke actually lost to Pepsi. Pepsi won <laughs> when it comes to diet drinks. So let's go look at Alzheimer's. A few weeks ago, and you know, people always bug me. You know, would you send us your lecture like in two or three weeks in advance? I go, no, because this stuff changes all the time. I'll show you articles that came out yesterday. Okay, and I work on lectures the night before because there's always new information. I don't want to bore you with old stuff. So the Alzheimer's Association. And one of the things I do is every day with patients, and I am a practitioner, I'm, I see patients, uh, next week I'll be in the office Monday through Saturday, okay, working. The next week I'll have two days doing research and teaching, and four days in the office. I work six days a week. But I say, you know, they drink milk, yes, buy Fair Life. Buy a cold filtered milk, right, no lactose. The sugars are greatly reduced, higher protein. Why not? You get it on sale for $3.50 and Mariano's and other big chains like that. Why not have a decent milk? So that's what I have for milk. That's a typical breakfast for me because I'm at an age where I usually don't eat much for breakfast. But I always have my kefir in the morning. I always have my kefir in the morning because you're having your probiotic and prebiotic too. I have to have my vitamin D3. I don't get enough because I wear clothes. <laughs> if I didn't wear clothes, I'd get enough vitamin D3 up in Chicago. I'd be awfully cold. Might spend some time in prison. But, and of course, you know what? I, uh, in the long lecture, I show you what I do. I roast my own coffee. I get my coffee uh, individually from my individual farm, single source. I roast my own coffee. I grind my own coffee. I love coffee. I'm a coffee addict, too. I love coffee. I'll say that, you know, I love coffee, hinting that someone will bring me some coffee, but <laughs> didn't work, the hint didn't get there. And besides, people say, you spend time on this? I say, yes, we do. My team does. My people who work with me, we all believe in this and have believed in it. Sometimes they get lazy, but doctor means to teach. I was told this in 1975 in dental school. A person gave a lecture, doctor means to teach. And so we spend our time teaching. Do no harm. Do not use the knife. We educate. This used to be an old poster. Sweet, delicious, but deadly. I love to show people how much sugar is in honey smacks, 56% sugar. Right? It's loaded with sugar. Don't eat up, Chris. Thank you, my friend. So another take home right here. Oh, yeah, mine. What, no sugar? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Okay, so take home. For you to tell everybody and get your team on board, sugar is addictive. It's addictive. It is. Look at what we have done in the Chicago area. 20% of the adults in the Chicago area are diabetics. 50% have metabolic disease. 90% have perio. We're sick. We're sick people. We're awfully sick. So all this, oops. OK, who wants to make a little quick grab for a freebie here? Uh, by the way, Peter is in the back from Probiora. They don't pay me. I'm not getting paid for doing this. Buddy, here you go. Take that to your office. Get us started. Get some probiotics going. So anyway, that's why I don't carry a mic. We're going to talk about dysbiosis, obesity, non-nutritive artificial sweeteners, which are horrible, cardiovascular disease, allergies, how we treat all this stuff with probiotics. But first, let's talk about causation correlation. Okay. Good way of looking at this is Chicago gun violence. Chicago is a war zone, right? Everyone knows that. Incredible death rate, often much higher than during the insurgency in Iraq. Okay. Uh, this is old data, 2014. Uh, almost 10,000 gun-related crimes in one year, and uh, 2,400 shootings, 
And of fatal shootings, 390 is hit as high as 550, two people dead a day, okay? But it's all in certain areas. And there's absolutely none in others. And there's an easy way of doing a, a correlation to this. And, oh, by the way, the timing is awful because always weekends and it's uh, just tragic, you know. In, in this one weekend, one the uh, children shot was an 11-year-old girl, you know, so on. I mean, it's, it's a lot of bystander uh, are injured people in their home watching TV. A bullet will go through their wall and kill them, so on. But if you look at another map, wherever there's a microbrew, there's no violence. <laughs> now, it'd be really easy to make the claim that be beer is civilization and there's no violence around beer. But we know that's not the case. The real reality is, is microbrews are only built in safe areas. And Chicago has 180 microbrews. So these areas, you can walk around 3 o'clock in the morning and no one's going to bother you. But other areas, it would be dangerous. So this is causation correlation. Don't, because you see something is, you know, you, you look at a study, and a study makes it look like they, there's a cause, effect, a lot of times there isn't. It just happens to be the way it is. Okay, so, so we have to be defenders of guardians of the oral cavity. That is our job. Okay, yeah, I'll be the Chris Pratt. Okay, <laughs> well we look a lot. We look like each other, so it's, it's it tries to mimic me all the time. So this just came out, and the American Academy of Pediatrics sent us out in a blast a couple weeks ago. Lactospirici. If you use a lot of disinfectants in your home, you increase the growth of the lactospirici, and that causes obesity in your children. So obesity in kids has been linked to disinfectants in the home. Don't mess with the microbiome, because you don't want to do this. And so more, I, I've given this to all the parents. Postnatal exposure, household disinfectants, in, infant gut microbiota, and subsequent with risk of being overweight in children. That is a really good article. Killing commensals. Here, let me go back. I often think we should have Bill O'Reilly write a book like he did, Killing Lincoln, Killing Patton, on killing commensals. Because we gotta get to the bottom of who's killing or killing Kennedy. Who is killing our commensals? And it's basically it's all of us, because everywhere you go, there's these little things, you know, use your hand sanitizer. You know how I rail about that at grocery stores and everything. I think it's just ab absolutely insane. It's crazy to do stuff like this. And then trying to sterilize the oral cavity. You can't sterilize the oral cavity. Wait, coffee break. <laughs> you just can't do it. And what you end up doing is you kill all the commensals. Now, there's a lot of mouth rinses far better than others. I'm not painting them with a, a, a broad brush. There's a lot of mouth rinses that do a lot less damage than others. But there's some, and we'll talk about, which are really, really bad for killing your commensals. Killing the important bacteria. And we have to know which bacteria you want to kill. So you have to do research on which bacteria. One of my all-time favorites is this published in the European Journal of Oral Sciences. The kids who get cavities get cavities because they're lacking their nitrate-reducing bacteria. Now, right now, we don't have a good probiotic for this. We don't. There are some, like Strep salivarius, that will actually reduce their nitrate-reducing bacteria. But the difference between kids who get decay and kids who don't get cavities is because the kids who actually have the nitrate-reducing bacteria, they're actually producing nitric oxide in the saliva, and that kills a lot of your pathogens like strep mutans and scardivio, witsia, and slacu acidua. So anyway, that's very important, nitric oxide. If you kill these guys, and this was known back in 2004, then you end up having all sorts of issues with karyogenic bacteria. So whatever you use should leave the nitrate-reducing bacteria alone. You don't touch them. You don't touch your gluten metabolizers. You want your gluten metabolizers to live. Those are important bacteria to keep. And lactobacilli, lactobacillus salivarius is one of those. Like strep salivarius reduces nitrate. Lactobacillus salivarius reduces gluten very, very well. Lactobacillus johnsoni does too. We don't have time to go into the gluten stuff. 
So the missing link is oral. This is from uh, current hypertension reports, oral microbiome and nitric oxide, the missing link in the management of blood pressure is published by cardiologists. These cardiologists are telling dentists in a cardiology journal that the missing link for management of blood pressure is oral. It's a great paper. Again, I apologize for the screen. But you need to allow recolonization of your nitrate-reducing bacteria. And here's a little chart on how this happens. Your diet has to be high in nitrates. You know, green vegetables, your greens. Eat the greens, which we used to eat when we got hungry, right? Pull some green leaves and just eat them. Those greens have a lot of nitrates. The nitrate-reducing bacteria break them down into nitrites. They are further reduced when they hit the stomach into nitric oxide, and it gets reabsorbed into your bloodstream. And then, very selectively, in the saliva, it's concentrated by a factor of 10 to produce a very high level of salivary nitric oxide. Would this be accidental? Of course not. It evolved that way to protect your oral cavity, to protect your gateway microbiome. Your good guys don't mind the nitric oxide levels. The pathogens don't like them at all. Now, nitric oxide is so important, as you know, it's a vasodilator, it drops your blood pressure. Right? Everyone knows if you don't have enough nitric oxide, if you don't have those, you have high blood pressure. You also have perio associated with that high blood pressure. That's the link, is your nitric oxide levels. I'll show you some research on that. This, I, I always quote to people, nitric oxide reduces blood pressure, protects against ischemia per reperfusion, reperfusion damage, restores your nitric oxide homeostasis, Associated cardiac protection, increased vascular regeneration after chronic ischemia, and the reversal of vascular dysfunction in the elderly. What is not good about that? They used to think nitric oxide was bad. Really, seriously, they used to nitric oxide is bad. No, 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 and you now know it's, it's important for you to live. Very important for you to live. Now, this is a great study published in the journal Nitric Oxide. Less than a year ago. They followed in the San Juan Overweight Adult Study, 1,206 overweight obese uh, individuals, free of diabetes, and they just looked at their use of mouthwash. How often do you use Listerine? How often do you use Scope? Here's our findings. Routinely use Listerine or Scope, you greatly increase your chance of diabetes because it kills your nitrate reducing oral bacteria. So see, none of these products actually work over a period of time because you kill your nitrate reducing bacteria. You simply end up having more decay. You end up having more perio. It happens very quickly too. Great study to read up on. The other big thing, this is published in Australian Dental Journal, as a lot of these mouthwashes have such a high level of alcohol, they greatly increase your chance of oral cancer, or squamous cell carcinoma. And they actually go through, they list a lot of the different products, and a lot of them have like 21.6% alcohol. And those high levels of alcohol are really, really bad. And there's kind of some good news, and oh, I skipped that one. But I was gonna show that actually IPA beers don't have that effect. I, I took a lot of slides out. That was the next slide, but actually a good red wine because the antioxidants, IPA beers, you don't have that effect. You don't increase the chance of oral cancer at all because the antioxidants. So, you know, what would you rather have tonight, sir? A nice good bourbon or a scope? <laughs> you do scope on ice, on the rocks? He does scope on, on the rocks, okay. So, again, take home is that when you get back to your office, a lot of these, the chlorhexidine-based, uh, oral mouth rinses, those with high levels of alcohol, they're not good for your patients. They actually create more problems. They increase blood pressure. They increase, down the road, perio. They increase vascular disease, heart disease. Increase erectile dysfunction significantly. One of the reasons there's an epidemic now at, now I have a whole lecture on the epidemic, erectile dysfunction, which absolutely makes no sense at all, which is associated with what? 
No, sir, you don't use scope that way. <laughs> Amazing how what people try to do with scope. It's like Windex, you know, put a little Windex there on that sore. My big fat Greek wedding. That was a great movie. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, now I almost forgot what we were talking about. I was having too much fun with that now. Um, uh, we were talking about what? Sleep. Yeah, tomorrow uh, in sleep, I'll show you the studies showing the uh, uh, ED, cardiac, nitric oxide, sleep issues. They're all combined. It's just like, you know, metabolic disease, obesity, cardiac disease, all that. It's all one disease. We just call it different names, but it's all one disease that we decide to describe each thing as a symptom. That's all it is. So anyway, wait, you answered that right, right back there. You, you helped me out a whole lot. Could you pass this back to that gentleman right there? Go straight back. Oh, I'll throw up, bud. Oh, hey, good receiver. Doesn't, I don't care who the quarterback is, if he had a good receiver. So anyway, all these things are related like oral cancer to mouthwash. And that's why I'm very, very careful what type of mouthwash I ever prescribe for anyone. Prebiotics and probiotics. Let's go all into all this because it's all dysbiosis, right? It's all dysbiosis. That's why we have dental disease. Then we always will have other things going on like trauma and so forth. But it's dysbiosis. How did we get to that dysbiosis? Well, it's over a period of time. Actually, you know, you have your Homo neanderthalensis right here, Homo erectus right there, that great hunter in that area of Homo sapiens, Homo ledi. If you look at the Homo ledi in there from the great uh, uh, expeditions done by University of Wisconsin and so on, and if you look at those a tremendous, I don't know why they always have frowns. Why don't they ever show a Homo ledi with a smile? They had to be happy at times. Yeah, I would humanize, come on. But if you look at all the skulls and everything, you find they have all these intact skulls, got lots of wear from bruxism because our species grinds. All the skulls show grinding. We're grinders, right? We're bruxers. Part of it has to do with how our teeth changed, evolved. They evolved differently to handle all these different foods and all these different requirements we have. So now we're all grinders. And we see perio, see some bone loss. And so early dental care was very, very easy. You just got a friend. We had a big, sharp rock, and it would help you with that loose tooth. <laughs> I doubt you'd even charge the guy. But it's all competition. You know, and this is one of the things like a lot of the good probiotics do. Like for instance, and, and it was in my institution that Dr. Stan Schulman, who's a very famous infectious disease expert, showed that why some kids get strep throat, strep pyogenes, is because they don't have enough strep salivarius. And that's where the strep salivarius K12 probiotic came from. I still use that all the time in the office. We have any family come in, history of strep throat and antibiotics, they always go on K12. Now, it's so funny. It's hysterical. I'm hearing from all the local pediatricians how they're doing it. They're telling parents, go online to Amazon, buy something K-12. They can't remember it's strep salivarius. But they go, something K-12, and that will help with the strep throat. It really, truly does. Because strep salivarius greatly inhibits strep pyogenes. And so here's strep pyogenes. Now strep uberus greatly inhibits strep mutans. Strep oralis greatly inhibits strep mutans because all the different streps try to connect to the biofilm in the same way. So they compete for each other. It's like gangs in Chicago competing for a neighborhood. They compete against each other to find a place where they can adhere, settle, and colonize, and then develop their, micro, their whole uh, kingdom. They do the biofilm. And so to disrupt this red complex, Sigmund Sokransky's red complex, the best thing to do is disrupt this complex with a fusobacterium nucleatum and the Prevotella negrescens by using strep oralis. Because strep oralis and strep uberus, they produce hydrogen peroxide. And a strict anaerobes, like fusobacterium nucleatum, they can't develop their colonies. That complex cannot go from the orange complex to the red complex if you disrupt it at the beginning. 
So when you disrupt disease with probiotics, you're disrupting at the very beginning. That's the concept. And the best way to do that is to do what? Do it before there's really bad disease, right? That's why we always like to start kids early on with the appropriate probiotic. So diagnosis is extremely important. Which probiotic to use? Man, I wish I knew. Because we're not quite there yet, but we have a lot of testing you can do. In the office, we use Carry Screen. We use Carry Free from Carry Free. It works. It works. Is it speci speci sorry, specific? No. It's not specific at all. It's very general. CAMESH Spectra, I'll show you that. My Perioplath from Oral DNA Labs, Mito Swabs, and doing Genetech. I'll go through all this stuff. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. You know, you could do salivary. Uh, Biome now has an oral microbiome they can run on you. And right now they're not taking any new customers because they are completely redoing their lab. They're coming CLIA uh, certified. So they're not taking any new customers. But as soon as they're done, they're going to have some really great testing they can do. Um, Omnigene collection kit. This is from uh, Genetech. Now, you might notice it says for research use only. That's how we use it. I do a lot of research. And I'll show you, it's very easy to collect saliva. Very easy to collect saliva on a young person. So, not a big deal. And then you know what you're dealing with. Is it expensive? Yeah. It's not cheap. That's the biggest problem we have right now. Mito swabs. We have a mito swab study going. I'll show you the IRB on it and everything. So we're looking at mitochondrial health. And I found out last night, last night on a phone call with one of the top mitochondrial researchers that I'm working with in our study, that they have found that mitochondrial health goes down before the perio. So it's a way of finding perio before it gets really bad or cardiac disease. Really fascinating, because then we can try to help the mitochondria, right? Now this is one, from a, uh, one of our pilot things. I did it on my youngest son, right here. And here's his mitochondrial health, and he's off the charts. Keith is a Spartan runner, runs eight miles a day. And during that run, he might be running through a river, climbing walls. He did an eight mile run in Thailand through jungle with leeches and big spiders and snakes and everything and crazy stories. It, that's what he does. I know. It's amazing. It, it's, I, I have to tell you this. It's really funny. So one of the areas, they had to take, a, they had to sleep at night. So he was in this hut. He woke up feeling something next to him, hut, snugging up to him. It was a little pig. And he got up, he walked out of the hut, and all the people in the village were laughing, going, oh, that's Lala, she does that. She likes to curl up to guys. Uh, it's kind of cute, isn't it? And it's kind of funny. But he's off the chart. Mitochondria, of course he is. And that's why we started that study with athletes. If you need to have a lot more energy, you need more mitochondria. Duh, right? But wait, think about this. That means you can increase the number of mitochondria. Where are they coming from? What causes your mitochondria to start to replicate, right? They're based on, quote, bacteria, but maybe actually archaea. So there's got to be a trigger that you could trigger to increase your number of mitochondria that make you actually a better athlete and healthier if you have mitochondrial disease. Boy, that's worth like $10 billion, right? So it's a great thing. And here's just some of the interpretation of his mitochondrial health. He has normal values, but he has three times the level of mitochondria per cell. So he gets the energy, right? People didn't, until we did that, no one knew, by the way. That was the first time it was discovered, was actually running those samples on Keith. Biome, we did biome with him too, by the way, because we had done biome before on people, and we just wanted to know which probiotic to use. I'm not gonna share you all those results. And then, of course, the entire gut microbiome, which you can do with a new biome. Now, this is what it used to be for two tests, was $400, um, of course, I always had you know, discounts you could do. But it, it not only looked for bacteria, but viruses, yeast, fungi, bacteriophages, and everything else that is in your whole living gut because your gut contains everything, right? Fungus, 
viruses. So it, it actually runs a whole transcriptome on you, which is fantastic. And that's what the whole thing is all about. You've got to look at that trans transcriptome because that tells you what genes are actually active, what genes are actually working, what is in, in play at the time in your entire gut microbiome. So that tells you a lot more information of what's going on at any given time. So that's why we track things like that. Now, metabolic studies are being done, and the funny thing is, th those are so important. Like right now, one of our autism studies, we're having the metabolomics being run by Imperial College in London, because that tells you all the metabolites. And you need to know metabolites. I'm telling you that in five, 10 years, you're gonna be doing these full studies. You're gonna be running metabolomics. You're gonna be knowing the metabolites. You're gonna, be know, you're gonna know what's going on specifically in that patient. And then you can specifically prescribe a probiotic that's tailored to that patient. And that's the study of metabolomics, large scale study of the actual number of metabolites, what they are for a given system, for a certain bacteria, for a certain cell, for a given individual. You look at the metabolomics. So I really do foresee a time where a company like Probiora may have actually five, six different types of probiotic mixtures and you match that to the patient. Does that make sense? I, th I think it really does. And so one of the big things we've always used was metametrics. And when my oldest son came back from that one tour in Afghanistan, he came back extremely ill, extremely ill. And the army had him back in the hospital. He went through the bases in Europe, um, Lynch, at the hospital there, and he couldn't keep anything in, he was bleeding badly. Uh, all sorts of gastric issues. He's Captain 101st Airborne and uh, came back and well, I, I did this, ran this like eight years ago on him and we did the metametrics and we found, yeah, there's some things off quite a bit, you know. Uh, he's missing a lot of protective bacteria but the main thing we found, a lot of infl inflammation going on, massive inflammation and all they could tell us when they ran it is he's got a really bad parasite but they couldn't identify it. There's nothing in the database that identified that parasite. It took him many months before he was, he's still not back to normal, gut-wise, but he went through a lot of pain and issues from that. And they actually had a rumor, I don't know how true it is, that a number of the 101st out of Wolverine got sick because the Taliban knew of some contaminated areas and they made sure that they contaminated the food supply. You can't blame the poor Afghans because the Afghans who had to go home, if they didn't comply with the Taliban, their family would be executed terribly. So all sorts of stuff like that. So what probiotic to use? People always say, well, let's have the government regulate it. And I go, that's worked so well before with the FDA. <laughs> let's try that again because they've been so great at their regulations on everything. So which probiotic to use? Well, it's a good question. Now here's a more current one that was done, Genova Diagnostics runs uh, Metametrics. This is a patient of mine that uh, everything's de-identified that has mast cell, mast cell disease and anything you do with her, she reacts. And everything, she was always told that she was, uh, this young lady was a hypochondriac. She's not. I can tell you, she reacts to everything, okay? But if you look at her diversity, it's nothing. If you look at her short chain fatty acid production, it's nothing. Now this is a test you can run tomorrow, right? You could do this tomorrow. You go home Monday in the office and run a test like this. And at the decrease, she has an important Prevotella, some Clostridia that are very important and protective. <coughs> she has none. No wonder the mast cells are going nuts. You would too. If it happened to you, you'd be in the same situation. You wouldn't be a hypochondriac. Short chain fatty acids, oh my God, way up high in the propionate, way low in the butyrate. That's called inflammation city, right? Gums will be inflamed, anything you do will be inflamed. This poor young girl, she's had all this terrible dentistry done because of the fact that she's a problem. And she's not a problem, she has a disease. The problem is we're not treating her disease. So she needs butyrate. She really needs to get butyrate. Other duck gut diagnosis would be Ubiome, and we mentioned Genova. The American Gut Project, how many people have done that? Sent their gut. Yay, thank you. We have a winner. Here we go. Yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of fun, isn't it? Because it's cheap. I think it's $90, like $180 for two. 
Uh huh. Seventy one, really? Here we go. Would you pass that back, please? Sure. Thank you so much. So yeah, that's that's cheap, cheap, cheap to do it. So go home, do twenty three me because we'll talk about twenty three me tomorrow, and then uh, do uh, the American Gut. It doesn't give you the most data, but it's done through University of California, San Diego. You can do Biome later when they get back up and running. Of course, Biome itself. American Gut, like I mentioned, University of California, San Diego, the Night Lab. And so here, I'm going to show you how to collect those samples. Now, we're going to talk about, I hope this doesn't gross everyone out. Because you know, as you know, when you collect those samples, you have to be very specific in how much you collect, right? So no one, I hope you guys all had breakfast already before we start grossing everybody out. OK, so here, here we're collecting a sample here. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Fooled you. We're just doing the oral microbiome on that one. I'm not showing you the fecal one. OK. <laughs> so anyway, they tell you how to specifically you know, swipe back and forth and get the appropriate oral microbiome. So you want to run both. You want to do the oral and the gut. Oral DNA labs. I got a lot of history to tell you on this one, which I think is a lot of fun. You guys all know about my perio path. You all know about how you can get all these results back and these recommendations. You know, I have done this with patients, like young teenagers and so on, that had severe perio. Their gums were just so horribly inflamed, and we do my perio path. And we come back with some really great results. Like one time, uh, they even contacted me saying, wow, a lot of treponema. You got to hit that girl with some flagyl, some metrodiazole. And I called up. She said, before you do anything, talk to my my GI doc. So I called up her gastroenterologist, who's at Northwestern. And I said, hey, she's got this really bad treponema. He says, oh, God, hit her with some flagyl. So she's eating metrodiazole for five days. Let's see what happens. She had severe IBS and went away. Her gum disease, the IBS, went away. Of course, what happened? It later came back. Yep. Came back, both came back. She had to change other things in diet, in environment, and she had to lose that boyfriend. <laughs> Just a little bit of a joke there because he had issues too. So she had to lose that boyfriend or get him on flagell. So now, of course, they have, you know, my perio ID, look into levels, interleutin 6 and so on, the genetic markers and all that. But here's my story I have to talk to you about. Let's go back years ago. And Tom Neighbors, I had just met him. You guys probably all know Tom Neighbors. So I drove down to Nashville because they had just basically gotten started with all these things. That's the old building in Nashville. And I met with Tom Neighbors and I said, this is wonderful. He showed me all the DNA PCR equipment and so on. I said, I want a pediatric version for this. I want a kid's version. We need a kid's version right away. We talked about it. We said, what can we do in the kid's version of it? And I said, well, look. Look at the studies right here on periopaths in kids. These are 6 to 13-year-old kids. And they already have Prevotella negrescens. They already have Agrogobacter and Porphyromonas gingivalis. They have all these pathogens already. And for those pathogens to come out and become full-blown disease, all you have to do is change the environment. That's why these kids get braces on and they go downhill so fast, right? I was so excited. I said, well, I want to look for all the, you know, karyogenic bacteria so we can do multiple tests. We'll do like one at age one. And we had this whole thing worked out. How can we do this? And we were going to call it My Oral Path. That was going to be the name of it. We talked about it. So I went ahead and I went to the AAPD, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, and I talked to my friends in the American Academy of Pediatrics saying, let's do this. Let's follow the exact same period that they have immunizations. We can do DNA testing only once, but the rest of the time, we can start off with strep mutans, Gardovia witsia, Slachia sigua, the nocardia. You know, go down the whole list. And we can look and see if we can find the harmful bacteria early on on these one-year-olds. And they looked at me like I had three heads. I mean, they hadn't even heard about Scardovia or Slachioa. So I had absolutely no support whatsoever. They go, well, that'd be terrible because you know, the public aid programs aren't going to support that. I go, yeah, I know, but how about the rest of the population? People have insurance. People have money who want to actually have this done. And then we can build this huge database. Imagine if we had done that, what, 10 years ago? When was that, about 15 years ago, Susan? 
something like that. If we had that information, we'd have this giant database right now, what is normal in children and what is not normal. It'd be huge. We could be following them as teenagers, young adults. Their biggest argument was, you'll never get the spit out of the kids. And I said, heck yes, I'll just put a brand new clean shirt on. What do you mean you can't get spit and spit up out of kids? I, I get spit out of kids all the time. This is, this is, are you real pediatric dentist? <laughs> Come on, what is all this? And so it really bothered me because at, you know, we can go test right now for Helicobacter pylori and have a result in seven minutes, right? You can get the HP tester right here, and in seven minutes, you know if the person has an HP infection or not. Why couldn't we do that for strep mutans? We have a longer, we, there is a GC one. It takes longer. It's not as accurate. But how about for Scardovia or Slacua? Why don't we do this? Why don't we test right now? Why don't we have a sample, a, 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 you know, a test for like Porphyrmonus gingivalis? that it, over a certain level, you know the person has bad problems with PG. Why don't we have this right now? This stuff has been around for a long time. I mean, 14 years ago, I was so excited because you could test for C-reactive protein in the saliva. I said, well, God, every any time now, we're going to be all testing and knowing everything about our patients at every one of their dental visits. It just hasn't happened. I blame organized dentistry because I think they should be fighting for this. I do. I think they should be fighting for this. Now, right now, what I do is, you know, I do research. So we have the Northwestern University Sequencing Center where we can do next generation sequencing. So I was just on the phone yesterday talking about our shotgun sequencing on one of our studies. And it was a very interesting thing. It's not for patient care, although we get information that helps a lot with patients. But now we have those next generation. We have shotgun metagenomics where we can do thousands of samples at one time to look at all these different strain-specific bacteria. So the technology's there, it's just very expensive, and thank God I can work and, and do research like this, especially with the metatranscriptomics, which is very important down the road. Now, I was talking to one of the mitochondrial guys yesterday, during a break, and one of the things they brought up is the fact that if you look at chronic periodontitis and look at coronary artery disease, and you look at the mitochondria, they're very unique, the mutations. Isn't that amazing? Now, this has been criticized because it was published in the Journal of Indian Society of Periodontology, but there are 12 novel mutations that occur between, in the mitochondria that are associated with periodontal disease and heart disease. And a lot of this has been thought to be brought on by Porphyrmonas gingivalis. I cut all those articles out because of time. But the other thing is, they think some of these mutations could be happening before the Porphyrmonas gingivalis gets really established. So there's got to be something that is there because it shows up before clinical signs. But wouldn't this be wonderful to have your patient first thing Monday morning come in, you do a salivary sample, you come back on layers saying, hey, you got mitochondrial disease, we got to work with your omega-3s. How about some L-carnitine? You need L-carnitine. Let's have you take some L-carnitine. Let's try to build your mitochondria back up. Let's get you going a little bit more exercise, cut out the sugar, which kills your mitochondria, and do all that good stuff. I think that's fabulous. So that's one of the take-homes. It's testing. Um, you just never know. You can say to a patient, I think we need to run a test. I've had very few say no. I'll tell them the cost. Very few will say no. They all say, well, if you think it's really necessary, let's run it. So that is the future, is diagnosis, right? That is the future. Now, carry screen is right now. I mean, we use, we've been using carry screen for forever since it first came out. Um, we do this routinely on patients who come in who are referred because they have a caries history. We want to look at the level of ATP, and this is a great way to find out very quickly. In a minute or so, you have your data. And the reason this works is, as you guys probably all know, is that the pathogens have a much higher level of ATP production. And in fact, in this article produced, uh, published in Applied Environmental Microbiology back like 20 years ago, they point out that one of the pathogens was strep mutans that they used. So strep mutans produces a ton of ATP. It has to, because that's how it maintains its intracellular pH. So these pathogens survive the stomach acid very easily. 
pathogens go right through the stomach acid. So, uh, you know, a lot of these treponema, they don't die in the mouth. They go right through the stomach and they go ahead and they uh, inhabit the small intestine causing IBS. So they survive the trip because they can produce high levels of ATP. And you have your ATP pump right here pumping out the hydrogen ion to keep this area a neutral pH. Very important. Now one of the things that fluoride does is fluoride inhibits your ATP pump. So fluoride will actually prevent a lot of these bacteria from surviving going down, but also kills all your commensals. A very small amount will kill your, your commensals. So having fluoride ingested on a regular basis is a really bad idea. Like, you know, I'm not talking about one part per million or 0.75 parts per million, but like if a kid's swallowing a fluoride mouth rinse, really bad idea because what it can do to the microbiome and cause a shift. So anyway, risk assessment, you know, we have to do a risk assessment and with carry free, you get to do that. You have low risk below 1500, moderate risk 1500 to 3500 and above 3500 a high risk. And we do this all the time. I'll skip all the Abraham Lincoln comments. And this is what like one of my employees will do. She's one of my staff members. This child was referred in with a high level of caries, recurrent caries, take a sample, and from that sample get a result in just over a minute. And the result in this case was really interesting. It was 9111, which is a call for help. <laughs> Come help me. What, do more restorations and not do preventive care? What happens? They come back in six months or a year needing more restorations. And we know this is a dysbiosis, it's a biofilm error, so we have to work with a prebiotic and a probiotic, right? Very, very important. Another way of just doing plain diagnosis, we do a lot of special needs patients, is of course a diagnodent unit. We have to because a lot of our patients have difficult times with radiographs. A large number of my practice are disabled. Special needs patients, right? And one of the most important things, though, with a diagnodent, and this is one of my hygienists using it, is the reading you get, you need to record. So six months later, you can check the reading again, right? Let me go back. Why? Not to see if there's a cavity, but to see how well your prevention program is working. How else do you know if your prevention program is working? That's why we do it. We can test ourselves. Are we doing the right thing? Are we using the right probiotic? Are we doing the right prebiotic? Is this system working? That tells us if we have a working system. One thing I really like, and I'd like to have uh, Air Techniques one day do a workshop. This was supposed to be a workshop, it got way too big. Can you imagine trying to do a workshop and have hands on with 300 people? It just, you couldn't do it. But you can use a CAMEX spectra because what it does is it measures the amount of fluorescence response from porphyrins coming from the microbiome. So people think of it as a caries detection system, but it's a microbiome measurer because you're actually looking at bacterial fluorescence. That's what you're looking at with a CAMEX spectra. And I first saw this at an ORCA meeting and I saw this great paper on how this works. And I was so excited, ORCA stands for Organization Carries Research. And if you go to an ORCA meeting where all the brilliant anti-caries people are, they always are disappointed on how well we're doing. They're always looking for options. How can we do things better? What could be better for our patients? And so it's not a whale. ORCA's not a whale. It's Organization Carries Research, okay? And so here are some studies on spectra showing it's very accurate at determining caries. I'm not gonna spend much time on this. It's very accurate. You can do sections of carious teeth after you spectra it, and it matches very, very well. So it tells you about occlusal caries. That's fine. It's a good way of monitoring it. This is how we do things clinically. Young man, severe gagger, has all sorts of issues, uh, developmental delay, uh, sensitive to everything, referred in. We do a PSP radiograph. We can X spectra scan things. We can be using nitrous oxide analgesia. We single tooth anesthesia, do everything. So there's a little clear nitrous hood from a porter called a silhouette. And we'd go ahead and we use, uh, you know, single tooth anesthesia for all our procedures. And I'll explain why. Because it works really well, very, very well for kids. Um, we do it every day. We use a single tooth anesthesia unit. We numb just the tooth. That's all. 
not the face, not the lips, not the tongue. No, I'm just the tooth and that three-year-old or four-year-old, five-year-old, they never bite themselves. They don't complain anywhere near as much. Not at all, really. And they're very numb. They're very, it makes people more numb. You just don't have this happening like with Bart Simpson here. Holy cow, I just bit my tongue. And even worse, I got this off the internet because we haven't had a patient like this in 10, 15 years. That's post-anesthesia, right? Kids will rip themselves up. So in treatment, we like to use a single tooth anesthesia machine, septodon. But here's spectra images. See right here, it shows where I use x-ray vision. I can see the porphyrin producing bacteria. It shows the bacterial fluorescence right here. And this means there's caries, deep dentin caries. It actually gives it a number, which is really important. Here's a patient that was referred in for a restoration in there. There's no caries. So we start a remineralization program. And just what? Microbiome modification. That's what you have to do. Cam at Spectre right here from one of the hygienists. She was doing this, and she said, oh, Dr. Cannon, look at this. I said, whoops, we've got perio. We're not looking for caries here. We have perio. Porphyrmonis gingivalis on this young patient. And so you can treat it early on. And treatment early on should be replacement therapy. You replace the PG with something better. Here's one of the systems you can use. And this is the photo, prolaxin photosan therapy. How many people have heard of this? Big in Europe. Very, very big in Europe. It's a unit where you get this vital dye, and you go around, you mix up the vital dye, you squirt it around into the sulcus. It's not that color, it's not green. And then you use your light unit that comes with it. It's a very, very, it's the most powerful light sold. It's 3,000 milliwatts, incredibly powerful light. And it vibrates, and if you can see here, all the porphyrmonis gingivalis, all the porphyrin producing bacteria, they glow. And you kill them all. Kills them in 30 to 45 seconds. Perfectly safe to humans. Great cytotoxicity studies done on this. I use this on disabled kids, Down syndrome kids who get the perio, you know, on the medial of the first permit molars. I can do this on any child, autistic kids and so on. And we go around and we treat it and we're killing, right here, the tip vibrates in there. And it takes about 30 to 45 seconds a tooth. I go around, and I kill all the porphyrin-producing bacteria. And then we rinse it off. And you would say, that'd be fine, but they would grow back, except for we use prolaxin, which comes with it, which is lactobacilli brevis and planarum. And the thing that lactobacillus planarum is famous for is adhering to dentition. That's the thing it's famous for, how it adheres. So you can go around. You can squirt that in there, and then they go home with a prolaxin, and then that is treated. I don't have to worry about it for several years. Do we have problems with these kids three or four years down the road? Often yes, because of what? Hygiene. They don't cooperate with hygiene, with their family, their caregivers, so it becomes more difficult. But it's bacterial replacement therapy. And probiotics, that's how they do it. I mean, probiora, same thing. Bacterial replacement therapy. So that's one of the take homes is you treat with bacterial replacement therapy. And I'm just going to guess here. Let's run this back five rows and four from the end. Five rows and four from the end. OK, so that's what probiotics does is replaces nature, right? We have to replace nature. And when does all this begin? Well, on little kids. And when it began at first, it was this great person Ilya Shemeshnikov, who if you go to Europe, you lecture at all on probiotics, everyone knows Ilya Shemeshnikov. Because he was the guy back in 1907 who said, a general belief is that microbes are harmful. This belief is erroneous. There are many useful microbes. And he discovered Lactobacillus bulgaricus inside the yogurt, saying these people are vastly more healthy. What have we done? So over 100 years ago, people knew there was a problem, right? Over 100 years ago, they knew about probiotics. And he got the Nobel Prize in 1907 for his theory of phagocytosis. He was a very bright individual. I used to tell the whole story of him, but I don't anymore because of time. And probiotics revolution, you have these books out like by Gary Huffnagel, like this, this guy, who's, again, 
He's not a crazy person. He's not an internet person. He's actually a professor of internal medicine, microbiology, and immunology, University of Michigan Medical Center. These are actually very accomplished individuals. But one thing I have to ask you to look at, look at the similarity. <laughs> same nose, same forehead, same type of hair, same chin. They, they could be, he could be grandson of Ilyush Meshnikov. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's hard for you to tell because it's not the best projector, but that is really incredible. Now, probiotics can be extremely specific, and that's one of the most important things to remember. They can be extremely specific. There are some heavily studied ones, and we'll talk about Probiora, how heavily studied it's been in specific strains. Here's one right here. It's such a specific strain that only grows on the European snowdrop flower petal. That's how specific. If you look at a lot of stuff like the Lactobacilli ruderi, it was found in a person high up in the Andes Mountains in Peru. That strain is very specific. And it has to be, don't go to a store and think, oh, I'm going to buy myself some strep oralis. It'll be just fine. It won't be. It probably won't even be strep oralis. So that's the whole idea. They're very unique. The strains are very unique in how they work. So by definition, life microorganisms, which when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. That was the diagnosis from 2000, I mean the d definition from 2002. It's of course wrong, because they don't even have to be alive half the time. There's a lot of positive uh, probiotics like Lactobacilli paracaceae that work when they're not alive. So it's a very important thing to remember. It's not Activia. Dannon doesn't make a product that is good for this. They got sued, as you know, right? And they lost, because they were pasteurizing it. So same thing on their Greek yogurt, they lost on that. I do refer a lot of people to kefir, Lifeway kefir, which is out of Skokie, Illinois. A Russian family came to Chicago, no surprise there. I mean, there's like 600,000 Russians in the Chicago area now. They came there and they opened up a kefir plant and it's very, very good. I use it all the time because I do love bacteria. And they make a bio kefir and they're very high in their CFUs. 20 billion CFU, that's high. A cup of the regular kefir is 20 to 25 billion. You can get it up to 30 billion if you keep it for a while. Now probiotics work because they inhibit the pathogens. They actually produce antimicrobial compounds like hydrogen peroxide to kill the pathogens. They compete with the pathogens for adherence sites and they compete with them for nutrients. So it's a huge thing. The good guys compete with the bad guys extensively. Now, what makes a pathogen is bacteria in the wrong place at the wrong time, and a probiotic bacteria in the right place at the right time. Because you can take a gut bacteria that's very good for you, a bifidobacteria, put it in the brain and you have encephalitis. You can put it in your lung and you have pneumonia, right? So it has to be the right bacteria at the right time in the right place. Because your microbiome changes. As you move, it changes as you age. Now, that's another whole story we're going to skip down the road because is it the changing, uh, is your age changing the microbiome but, or is it the changing microbiome that makes you age? Ah, that's worth another $10 billion. So whoever solves that issue. So there's huge amount of interest. I always love when someone tells me, oh, there's no research on probiotics. I go like, are you kidding me? There's over 100 publications a month in peer-reviewed journals. There are so many wonderful publications on probiotics. And this is old data, too. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. A lot of it is being driven on by the antibiotic resistance issue, um, which keeps getting worse and worse every day. Things are getting worse with antibiotic resistance. There was a bill I don't think ever got passed, which was supposed to preserve antibiotics for medical treatment only. They could not be used because the biggest recipient of antibiotics in the United States happens to be pigs. Yeah. Thank God no longer in poultry, right? They removed antibiotics from poultry and all the things they said was gonna happen about, oh, we wouldn't be able to afford chicken has been nonsense. Purdue, Tyson are making more money than ever on that. They, it was a land 
landfall for them. It's just amazing how much money they make off of it. So prevents the growth of pathogens, compete with the pathogens, it regulates your immune system, extremely important, modulates how you respond to everything. That's why we have allergies. Hopefully we'll have time to show why people get allergies today they didn't used to get at all. And some of the research that's been done at Northwestern on it. So as we cured all the infectious diseases with antibiotics, we created all the autoimmune diseases. So we end up still being sick, just sick with other things. And one of the things is you can boost in a child like the IgA production simply by adding probiotics to their formula. And that's why in many countries, what is it? It's mandated that the formula has probiotics in it because everyone's concerned about the lack of breastfeed. Like we mentioned in the Mexico thing, uh, most women only breastfeed three months. The recommendation from World Health Organization at least a year, right? Because of the development of the microbiome. And breast milk is full of things, oligosaccharides, only for bacteria, not for baby. And everyone knows that. That's, I mean, that's one of the things that breast milk is noted for, is the fact it's not even designed for the baby. It's designed for the gut microbiome of the baby, which is a very important factor. So breastfeeding itself is so important because not only do you get the specific uh, oligosaccharides necessary for the gut, for the baby, but you also get skin cells, which help also promote lack of allergies because you're telling the baby what is normal cells and the mother cells should be very, very normal. The other thing is a specific microbiome exists on the breast. The breast itself has a very specific microbiome. And that change of the microbiome does what? Greatly increase the chance of breast cancer. If you've seen all the studies out there the last few years, how a change in the microbiome just ups the rate of breast cancer significantly for the individual. So you have a genetic predisposition and it gets turned on epigenetically by a change in the microbiome of the breast. So all these are important things. And also the breast milk itself is loaded with a lot of very important bacteria, which is something that was shocking to a lot of the researchers at first, but like Kirsty Argard, I mentioned her before, she's done a lot of research on breast milk also. So, you know, start them off right. One of my former students sent me this picture of his son um, having his first lamb chop. He says, you said varied diet. He eats the most varied diet. He eats what we eat. And I've always had my kids eat what I ate. My kids never had a, a kid's meal. I mean, this is going back 35 years now. So when I would go into a restaurant, and it'd be a Cajun restaurant, and i go, you know, uh, I think uh, my little one-year-old wants a crawfish etouffee. And they go, you don't want like a grilled cheese sandwich? I know, no, I don't want that fake American cheese. I, I want, I think you want crawfish etouffee. And so my kids always ate what I ate. And today they eat everything and no allergies. Because my wife is extremely allergic to everything. No allergies in the kids, not a bit. They ate what I ate. And that was it. That's, I'm a tough dad. They tell me I'm a really tough dad. But there are kids who do need to have things. And here's that uh, probiotic I told you about for ear, nose, and throat care, the Bliss K12. There's also M18 now, uh, strep salivarius. Funny story, I'm in the, I work out of the Special Infectious Disease Lab, and a guy running the lab said, hey, Stan Schulman was in. He walked through the lab, and he looked up, and he saw a K12 M18 up in the, in the lab freezers. He goes, where did that come from? And... Bill said, I told him that, well, Mark Cannon got it direct from New Zealand from Jeremy Gilbert, the researcher who sent it directly. And Stan Schulman was so happy. He says, finally, we have what we need to fight strep throat. And, and that was like 10, 15 years ago. So anyway, this is a fabulous article published in Pediatrics. This is old, 11 years ago. Mom knows best, bacterial imprinting of the neonatal immune system. Lessons from maternal cells. And I'll just go through this really quick, not spend a lot of time on it, but the circulating monocytes pick up bacteria from the mom's gut. Live bacteria deliver them straight to the breast and they're delivered in breast milk directly to the baby alive. There's also dead bacteria, they know now, DNA signatures being delivered. Why would that be? To populate, to colonize the baby's gut. Why else would a body, the human body, keep bacteria alive within mononuclear cells and circulate it to the breast to be pumped out to the baby? 
That's why. And the dead ones tell the baby immune system, these are bad guys. Now we know this happens before birth in the bloodstream, through the umbilical, through the placenta. Same thing. We have to do this because how else can we program the baby to survive this onslaught of this huge microbiome genetic material? It wouldn't work. You can't develop an immune system in hours. It takes quite some time. So one of the things I always used to do, and you want another take home, um, I would go to the Lamaze classes. And besides, I was an expert in Lamaze, having been through it five times. <laughs> And so I would go to the mom's classes and I would get them started right away on the moms on Probiora. Some of them, BioGaia. I would get them started on that in xylitol. Get them started during pregnancy. So they end up having the right microbiome for the baby before the baby's born. Back into the dinosaurs too. And Northwestern, again where I'm from, is a, where that university that caused a big fuhr when they came out with the research that the average child in Evanston, Illinois, which is a well-to-do, relatively well-to-do suburb of Chicago, is sicker than the average child growing up in the slums of Manila. That was a wake-up call for Northwestern University, that's for sure, and for most people. So there's a lot of different bacteria out there, but don't forget, things like Fluorostore, it's great for preventing diarrhea during antibiotics. But Saccharomyces boulardii is only there for a short period of time. It's a yeast, it doesn't stay in your gut. You put it in, it comes out. Put it in, it comes out. Sometimes it comes out too fast if you have diarrhea. But it goes in, it comes out. Whereas Lactobacilli ruteri is always in a person. And this is a study that was done from Foresight Center showing here you have strep mutans, strep oralis. Right here, here's strep oralis, like in Probiora. And you have an increase in these bacteria at the time. Here's Fusobacterium, Fusobacterium nucleatum, increasing at age two to three. Perio, why? Grandma kisses the baby, right? Grandpa kisses the baby. Grandpa's going in for all on four. Yeah. And you spread bacteria back and forth all the time. So grandpa's going in for all and for it gives baby lots of kisses. You have a big increase in lactobacilli ramosus right here at age three, and big increase in lactobacilli ruteri that occurs at age three. These are all very important things. This is from a study that was presented by Ann Tanner uh, from Foresight, and it was a great one on oral flora caries free one to four year old kids. So you look at caries free kids and say, what do you need to have? And what do you have to have? Strep oralis. Lactobacilli ruteri. And here's the actual charts. And what happens is like a lot of the pathogens like strep mutans and strep gorgani actually go down a lot. They drop a lot if you don't get decay. If you get decay, they go up. They go up because you're giving them sugar. They drop down because you got them on prebiotics, xylitol, or you have them on a probiotic like Probiora or BioGaia. So this is a BioGaia study, which I thought was really a cute one. And this was published in Pediatrics. I mean, all this stuff is really, really old. This stuff goes back a lot of it, decades, right, on how well this stuff works. 14 child care centers for 21 months, and they only looked at things like diarrhea, okay, and fever, and absences from health care. Look at the difference. When you have them lactobacilli ruteri, look at the difference in diarrhea. Triple blind study, differences, in, the health differences are huge in kids. So when I have a family history of the kids not being healthy, what do I put them on? You know, I put them on a lactobacilli ruteri protect us early on, the infant, the infant formulation, because we like to look at family histories. Now again, I mentioned I did raise five kids, so preventing diarrhea is really important and when you raise five kids. I mean, you know, think about it, for, for like 12 years, I had somebody in diapers, nonstop. Okay, that's a lot of diapers. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, and then a lot of these, like this, uh, again, lactobacilli ruteri, they really kill porphyromonas gingivalis, really kill lactobacilli ruteri. In fact, they do it better than ciprofloxacin. Can you imagine that these guys produce, uh, and same thing with a uh, probiora, they produce 
antibacterial compounds, bactericins, that kill better than antibiotics. And, and the bacteria know this, but they can't get through it, the pathogens, whereas they have with the antibiotics, even though a lot of those genetic information, remember what just happened not too long ago where they looked at uh, a, a sample of typhus that was from 1915 from World War I, and it showed that they had the gene to prevent, uh, uh, and it had a gene for antibiotic resistance already. And they were like, wow, those genes have been around a long time. That's the whole thing with the giant global genomic landscape, as it's called. We have all these genes that cause things like cancer, but we all carry them. They get turned on. And they get turned on from constant stress. Uh, Vadim Bachman is another person I want to have as a speaker. He's the guy who showed that there's a global genomic landscape in all your cells. And if you keep stressing them toward apoptosis, they turn on survival genes. And these survival genes come them, cause them to multiply and become more primitive. And start, that's why they start releasing all these capillary development factors. And the tumor grows and gets more blood supply, right? And the thing is, when you have that in the human body, it has a field effect, the Warburg effect. So you can take a sample of the oral mucosa and know if there's cervical cancer or prostate cancer because of the field effect on cells, which is amazing research. Did you guys see all that stuff and all the news reports on biophotonics? And this guy, he, he's not a crazy guy. He's a, at Northwestern. Um, he's, uh, He's actually a mathematician turned physicist turned biophysicist. And he's the one who's been working on saving the coral reefs and the bleaching and everything. He and his wife, they're brilliant researchers and they, they, have, they think ways to make chemotherapy three times more effective and save many, many lives. You know, they're really working on this really quick. But anyway, this is going back to the same old thing. You can use these because they don't have, uh, the pathogens cannot resist these bactericins. So they don't become immune to it. They don't become immune. Now, if you go to like your local, you know, GNC or something, you're, you're giving all these examples or at Walgreens or CVS of probiotics, but an important take home thing is most of them don't work at all. Most of them aren't even the right bacteria species. They're the wrong species, let alone the right strain. You have to look for the strain number. It has to be exactly if it says, you know, M, 12 or M18 strep salivarius, it is. But if they don't say that, it's not. Okay, so don't buy the, don't buy the junk. And the good stuff has been heavily studied to make sure it will not overwhelm the human body. They've done studies to show you cannot get an infection, like this case is lactobacilli ruteri, and they've made sure it is actually sensitive to antibiotics. So if you did end up with a lactobacilli ruteri infection of the brain, you could treat it with amoxicillin. Okay, that's the studies have been done to make sure that these probiotics work. And there's been work done like by Savant Twetman and others showing that yeah, you do these probiotics and these probiotics greatly reduce the level of strep mutans. And I could show you about like 10 studies, but I'm just gonna to go to one of my own really quickly. Now, these things were always in our diet. You know, fermented products are high in lactobacilli ruteri. Fermented dairy products are high in that. But kids nowadays, they don't eat fermented foods unless you make them eat kefir. And so the problem with kids is they tend to have this type of attitude toward the good foods. And, and my answer to that has always been, you know, as a parent and a grandparent, Give them the good stuff. Don't give them the bad stuff. Don't, they won't let themselves starve. Don't eat it. And then they'll learn to like it, which is very important. But there are answers out there. Lifeway makes these kefir bars. This is really great. They make this pro bugs for kids. Very yummy. Uh, again, it's loaded with probiotics, right? And my all-time favorite for the summer is actually, besides the kefir like this. Oh, by the way, here's the um, what's in there. Lactobacilli ruteri, lactobacillus plantarum, Ramosus, Lactus, Bifobacterium longum, Brevid, they're all in there. And these are good bacteria. And look at the CFU, 25 to 30 billion CFU. 
And this is why people are using kefir rinses for perio, right? You've seen some of the studies out there, post-healing oral surgery, you can use a kefir rinse. Post-healing uh, perio, anything, rinse with kefir. I know a lot of patients have told me that they've learned to, before they swallow it, they switch it back and forth in their mouth a little bit, let it warm up, then they swallow it, and they get rid of all their perio pathogens. So, you know, why not do it? Doesn't it make sense? Because you have all these bacteria that are notorious for killing the pathogens right in that. It's a perfect way of doing it. And this is really interesting, too. I put this up because, again, I don't know if I'm combative or if I come off funny. I don't know what the problem is. But I was mentioning probiotics to a group of pediatric dentists. And one of them, who's well-known, got up and said, and I quoted him, there is no published study showing evidence supporting probiotics. And so I sent him this article, Probiotics and Periodontal Disease and Health. And it's an old article, but it had like all these. There's like 12 studies, all showing very positive results. And I sent him one of my own articles, one of my own studies, showing very, very positive results with probiotics. And he never quite changed his mind on it. So here's one that's really interesting. This came out of Korea. And Korea has NHANES like we do. And they looked at people's consumption of yogurt. One yogurt a week. And they went through all these tens of thousands of young people, and they looked at perio and the consumption of yogurt. Guess what? One yogurt a week greatly reduces your chance of perio. How much more effective can something be? It's not related to the calcium. Although calcium does help, right? We have all the new studies showing that actually calcium does help a lot in preventing perio and bone loss. And so you look at that, you just go like, Holy cow, what is wrong with people? Why don't they get it? Can someone tell me why they don't get it? I mean, I could show a thousand studies, and they just seem to ignore them all. And one of the things we always talk about is how it inhibits Fusobacterium nucleatum. And we know how important that is for like prevention of preterm birth and premature birth and low-term birth babies. And Yiping Han, who has been a speaker here, She's a tremendous speaker, and she gave this great research on the effect of Fusobacterium nucleonum on preterm birth and so on, and how Fusobacterium nucleonum can release a bacterial virulence factor, FAD-A, that breaks down the intracellular connections, that opens up a flood of bacteria that can cause a bacterial infection of the fetus. And of course, there was that famous study that was done not just with mice, but also with uh, uh, miscarriages, showing that Fusobacterium nucleatum was present in every miscarried fetus, right? All that great stuff like this. What is really interesting, because this plays more of a role also with colorectal cancer, is that it is strain-specific on Fusobacterium nucleatum. That there is a big increase in fad A and adenocarcinomas. So they know there's probably some type of correlation. Not sure if it's a complete link or not, but you can get colorectal cancer from fad A showing up and turning adenomas into adenocarcinomas. That's the theory. But I was at a big conference which had all the top people on Fusobacterium nucleum research, all 10 of them in the world. Big conference, get it? That was a little joke there. There was like 11 of us sitting in the audience, and they were showing how it is very strain-specific for which Fusobacterium nucleatum. And if you have the right Fusobacterium nucleatum, you didn't have perio, and you didn't get colorectal cancer because it didn't produce fat A. So one of the concepts is to try to block the fat A production. What prevents you from getting MRSA? Here's a take-home thing. What prevents you, now what is it, 20, 8% of dental workers have MRSA in the nose, something like that, 38%, 28%. What prevents you from having MRSA is the presence of methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. So if you have the sensitive staph aureus, then you don't get MRSA. It's only if you get the methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So they said you should probably try to get some staph from a friend. Yeah, get a good friend who doesn't have it because the majority, now a lot of us carry it in our noses, right? So 
uh, this is a really a great study. Um, again, this is a Kirsty Argard study in Malawi. And they actually have something like 12,000 women or 11,800. You can look this up in clinicaltrials.gov. And they, in one of the groups, they have them on xylitol gum. And xylitol is considered a prebiotic. And what they are finding is that there's a great reduction in miscarriages and periodontal disease. So yeah, definitely. They can make this far more effective by adding a probiotic to it. This is the route things have to go. This is the future. There's Kirstie Argard. I first met her at, uh, actually at the Nobel Assembly in uh, Stockholm. So a lot of this stuff goes back forever, like K.K. Mackinnon, right? In the Belize study, we all know about how xylitol works. I'll go through this very quickly. It's a study done in Belize where they had a very high sugar intake, very high caries rate, wanted to see how to prevent it. So they did the xylitol and the sorbitol gum. Xylitol gum worked a lot better. We'll go through some of the things here because this is important. When you look at this classic study from Soderling on transmissions of mutant streptococci from mom to baby, starting at three months chewing gum, the moms are chewing the xylitol gum only transmitted the mutant streptococci 9.7% of the time. If they're using a xylitol varnish, it happened 28% of the time. If they use fluoride varnish, 48.5% of the time. So you see, if you have a mom transmitting the mutant streptococci, you can prevent that by having the mom chew xylitol gum. You guys all know the Isocanda study that followed up later showing that even 10 years later, there was a 75, 71 to 75% reduction in caries rate in those kids. So you're interrupting the transmission of mutant streptococci with xylitol. And xylitol is great because it's very specific for the pathogens. It hurts the pathogens a lot more than it does the probiotics. So that's what you want. You want to knock down the pathogens with xylitol and use your probiotic to change the biofilm. And here's just some of the xylitol products, or you can buy this, which is whiskey toothpaste for only a dollar. <laughs> it's six proof, it's genuinely true whiskey toothpaste. I prefer the bourbon one if you're from Nashville, you like to have the bourbon toothpaste. I know how you feel. There's not an IPA one, I really feel bad about it. That's, that's actually my oldest son when he was in Afghanistan. That's actually Kazakhstan. This area is known as Talibanistan. And that was the furthest we went. That trench was right there. And when he was there, they had meals ready to eat with xylitol gum. And so the army had xylitol gum. Everyone knows the effect of microbiome. Okay. He became Hunter First Airborne. That's my, my, that's my dad, uh, B-17 pilot, my mom. Because my dad's brother right here uh, was Hunter First Airborne. Here his picture right there in World War II, and he died in the Battle of the Bulge in Bastogne. And so my oldest son, after 9-11, volunteered, went in as an officer, and uh, uh, joined Hunter First Airborne because of it. So I mentioned I, I see a lot of kids with special needs. That's why we use a lot of xylitol products. They're very, very safe. Those kids from swallow, eat, so on. We have all these. Uh, and you know the funny thing is? They stay healthy. Generally, they stay healthy because we use our prebiotics, our xylitol. Now, I'm going to look at the study real quick right here. And this is a study that was published. Uh, it's a review, meta-analysis, and it's not a very good review. It was published, and everyone believes it, looking at the effectiveness of xylitol. And what they basically did is they ignored all these studies, like the Turku study. They started after. Say they started at January 1st, 1995, not 1994. So they could cut out all the Turku studies. Then they ended it before some other studies came out. So they cherry picked the dates a little bit, okay, which is sad. But they basically showed that it worked well for toothpaste, a little nebulous on gum, and they excluded a lot of the other polyols. And when they did that, they cut away all the good studies. So just because you read a meta-analysis doesn't mean it means anything. Especially when someone starts off with like 1,800 studies and ends up with five. Okay. I really, that really bothers me. I see it all the time. And so they end up with uh, just a few studies that they kept in it. And I hate to be picky on it. Here's the results. Toothpaste works. Wipes work. Gum varied, they said. You know, high risk of some bias because a lot of studies were done in the same place. They showed two studies not working. So they said xylitol didn't work because they had this study not working, this study not working. But this study actually was this study, the Alanan study. They're both the same study. That was just the little clinical trial beforehand. So that actually doesn't count. Then they said, 
looking at the Stecken Blick study, it didn't work. I have to explain this to you. Because I looked at that and said, wow, that's kind of interesting, because a person's name is Stecken Blix. So in an article, when they get the author's names wrong, you kind of wonder how well they read the study, right? Right? I, I, this is just me. And I know Savant. And I go like, this is one of his graduate students. going like, this is crazy. He had two groups. Two groups. He had a xylitol group and a xylitol and fluoride group. Two groups. No control group. And in the xylitol group, they got half the dose they're supposed to, 2.5 gram. And the fluoride group, which was xylitol and fluoride, they got twice the amount of fluoride you're supposed to get. And they compared the two. And what they showed is that there was no difference in the groups. No difference in the xylitol group, no difference in the xylitol fluoride group. What does that mean? Quickly. It means that the fluoride didn't work. Not the xylitol. They claim the xylitol didn't work. But think about logically. If one group is xylitol, the other is xylitol fluoride, and there's no difference, it's a fluoride that didn't work. But it's stupid because they had a dropout rate of 28%, noncompliance of 59%. That published, it should never have been published. It should have never been published. Let alone being the thing to change a meta analysis, right? So, and the fluoride in the drinking water was less than 0.3 parts per million. So you know the thing is bogus. It didn't work at all. Just due to non-compliance. But it's quoted all the time. So don't throw out the baby with the bath water. There's a difference when you look at the research. And so there's KK Makanan. I had the pleasure of spending time with him uh, on a boat in Europe. He, was, he lectured on some of the crazy stuff you see in studies. And wonderful individual. So prebiotics, how about erythritol? That's one too. And we have to get through these so we get on to more probiotics. But the prebiotics, you got xylitol, sorbitol, erythritol. And according to nutrition, erythritol is a sweet antioxidant. And it works in a lot of ways. But it's a strong radical scavenger. And then you urinate out, out, ur urinate out the erythros and the erythrolose. So you see, it's an anti-inflammatory, erythritol. That's why it's in Monster Zeros. It's an anti-inflammatory. They're trying to be very healthy. <laughs> They're trying to improve your health with guaranar and erythritol and extra caffeine. Makes you feel so much better to know it's really good for you. <laughs> a little sarcasm. But see, xylitol is also listed as a prebiotic because it changes what you have for short-chain fatty acid production. It increases the amount of butyrate you have and inhibits a lot of the pathogens. So it increases your butyrate production. And I'll show you one of our own studies we did at Northwestern, which got a lot of interest. Very well done study on that. So erythritol inhibits porphyrmonas gingivalis and strep gorgani, both. And this is extremely important because when these two get together, they produce something that's a bacterial virulence factor associated with Alzheimer's. So you see, you could take those people who are taking too much sugar, give them erythritol, inhibit strep gorgani and porphyrmonas gingivalis, and not only cut down perio, but also on Alzheimer's, and reduces the biofilm formation, the extracellular matrix. So now we know that this xylitol, which is for anti-caries, also affects the phagocytosis by porphyrmonas gingivalis. So it's a natural anti-inflammatory. It cuts down the autoimmune reaction because it prevents all this from going on. Isn't that amazing? It, natural anti-inflammatory. I tell this to people all the time. It's a natural anti-inflammatory that we got used to. And also agrobacter. I'm going to go through these really quick, but you see all the good studies have been done on this. Agrobacter and peridinal inflammation is reduced by xylitol. So that's one of the takeouts. The prebiotics, which also can include the polyols, not because they're metabolized, but because they change the metabolites of the pathogens, porphyrmonas gingivalis, agrobacter, and how they react. So oral products for oral use. From birth, yeah, you could do a probiotic from birth. And the probiotic that most people use early on is lactobacilli ruteri. 
You can also use BioCult. But I tend to use the BioGaia Protect Us Baby because healthy early microbiome sets up their allergies later in life, their eczema, their asthma, and everything else besides caries and periodontal disease. And the thing about this is that there's been over 130 clinical trials on lactobacilli ruteri, on Protectus. 130 clinical trials showing effectiveness, heavily studied in Europe. So this is what babies get. This is what we do for babies. You see Biogaia Protectus baby right there. And that's what my grandson got started on right after birth, right there. So dental caries is an epidemic, periodontal disease, and systemic disease we have going on. That's tragic because of all the cardiovascular effects. When they're older, I usually go to ProBiora Pro. That's why, pro, that's why they're here. It's because I, it's a wonderful product. Little kids also, this is really good. This is Pedialax. That's made by BioGaia. And my grandson's now on this one because he's had problems with constipation. And hopefully we'll get to some studies on constipation showing it's not fiber related, it's microbiome related. By the way, fiber has been a, a terrible um, distraction. And of course, bliss is really important for strep throat. So issues, ENT, strep throat, constipation, protection against caries, periodontal disease, and early development of the immune system for infants. That's how you go through your probiotics. So there's not just one. Now the microbiome responds to everything. So you have to be careful when you're doing this because you want to respond positively. It's a very important thing. It's not static, but it does change. It doesn't like to change though. So it takes time for you to change your microbiome. You can do it, it will do it, it takes time. So diet, probiotic, prebiotic is all important. So again, as a take home, most probiotics you find out there are actually worthless. You wanna work with something that's been around for decades, like Probiora. Okay, there you go. Probiora, you wanna work with that because the research going back to Jeff Hillman, back to 78, and Sokransky and so on, and then you know other good ones like Lactobacilli ruteri with all the studies they have. What we do a lot in the office, we do replacement therapy. So sometimes we have to go in and kill off the bacteria first. We use Servotec Plus, which is 1% chlorhexidine, 1% thiamol varnish. It was approved in 2008. It's a localized kill. It's a localized kill only. It's a varnish. And we place that like here on this patient. First phase orthodontics, I look at this. I mean, her microbiome is shot. It's not responding. She had those braces off like three months prior, and they still look really bad. That's a cry for help. That's perio. She may be 10 and a half, but she's got perio. Okay? So what my hygienists will always say is, hey, I'm going to do some Severtop Plus. They go around, they apply that. And as soon as we get that on around the gingival third right here, we're just killing the pathogens here. That's all we're doing right here in this area. It's localized, it's not systemic. Then we start a probiotic. You know, BioGaia gum or Probiora. And norm we do Probiora now, Pro. So this is how we get things started. Now, for a while there, we did BioGaia gum too. Now I have actually published a lot of this stuff, like this is inside dentistry, clinical applications of probiotic therapy. So you, you can look this up, inside dentistry from 2011, where I go step by step on what we do in the office. But this is how you need to work. You're not systemic, localized. Go replacement therapy whenever possible. Here's one of our own studies. This is a DNA PCR study done at the Human Genomics Center at Northwestern. So we went in and got a bunch of samples on these kids. We had 60 kids, six to 12 years of age, very cavity prone, very, very, they don't look at that four. They average like seven or eight uh, cavities each. A lot of them had recurrent decay. They came in and for 60 days we placed them on probiotics. We collected their samples. They were on um, the predecessor to Probiora, which was Evora kids, and they were on uh, Perio Balance, which is Lactobacilli ruteri, that was from Butler. Okay, so we have the two big ones we talked about 
or in the study. And we had a massive shift in the microbiome. Before and after, before and after, before and after, before and after, a massive shift from a karyogenic to non-karyogenic microbiome. So it's very, very effective. Very significant difference in the use of the probiora and with the uh, biogaia, might as well call it what they are now, and uh, before and after when it came to carriers. And this is published. Why is that so bad? Is that as bad for you guys as it is for me? That's a really bad projector. Holy cow. Oh well. I can't do anything about it. I can't reach it. I'm just a little bit too short. Just a little. So anyway, it's published in Journal of Clinical Pediatric Dentistry. Um, so it's a very, uh, a very good article read on that. And then we follow through with a retrospective study afterwards. Right here, we look back at these kids three years later. We wanted to see what happened to the caries rate. So we went back, we pulled out the kids' records. We were able to go ahead and find 53 of them out of the 60. So that was great. Three years later, we found 53 out of the 60 kids. And we looked in for caries. Hey, what's the caries record on these kids? And remember, they were extremely caries prone kids. And all that was done was a 60 day course of a probiotic. That's it, nothing else was changed. I'll show you the whole criteria later. Nothing else was changed. But they converted, only four remained caries active. The rest became either caries resistant or caries free. That's awesome, nothing does that. You can't do that with fluoride, you can't do that with anything, just with probiotics. And you know, all this stuff is out there published, we showed the stats, you know, these kids Pre-probiotic average 5.51 carries on a visit. The national average 1.84 during that same year. Post-probiotic, they were at 0.75. I mean, this stuff is all very, this is all done triple blind. We didn't know what they were on. I mean, it was the usual stuff, all you know, vetted by our medical school and everything. Here is the big change statistically, just absolutely huge in the response with these two probiotics. And so it was very significant. And you know, I went ahead and I presented this at one of our uh, dental meetings for the IADR and everyone involved in, in Carrie's research, they all came by, they all said, yes, we know this. Why can't we get this to happen? They're not getting it to happen because none of the states will approve probiotics. See, for like, for public health care. And because of that, they're not going to push the insurance companies. They will cover fluoride, but they won't cover probiotics. It would save billions of dollars for them to cover probiotics, but they just won't do it. And so I had this picture, and that same weekend I went home, I found this picture. <laughs> Cleaning the basement. It's a black and white, which you can't really tell with a screen. It's a black and white, hand-developed picture of me, 1975, presenting on the autoimmune disease called periodontal disease and phagocytosis of uh, Bacteroides melanogenicus 25261 and how it would initiate the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Because that's how I got started was in micro. I was a micro research assistant. You see, that's how I got started. And there I am you know, with my hair, the same. I, I don't look any different at all. I was 75, it's really funny. And so, uh, anyway, there's many validation studies, like Savant Twetman came out with this one. It was Onivora Plus, but that's now the uh, Probiora. That's now Probiora. And he reduced the caviar rate um, by 75%. Went from 0.2 to 0.8. And the funny thing about this study done in Sweden by Savant is that the kids, there he is, Savant Twetman, he's a great guy, had a low caries rate to begin with. It was like the hardest study to do because it had a low cavity rate to begin with, then he reduced it by 75%. Okay, that's a hard study. And that is so significant. There's a lot of validation studies like this. So when you look at all these probiotics, you have a big decision to make on what the child actually needs. What are you gonna work with on that? And again, like I mentioned, you know, strep throat right here, you got the BioGaia for the real little kids like this, you got this for the older kids and so on. I'm not sure about these. Advanced oral hygiene, what does that mean? Where's the research? Where's the publications? Where is it made? 
So most aren't that effective, so don't get fooled. Probiora has been around for quite some time. It really got started with the guys like Jeff Hillman, who are looking at replacement therapy, looking at the three bacteria, Streptococcus aurelis, Strep ratus, Strep uberus, and you see the strain numbers like Strep ratus, JH145 stands for Jeff Hillman 145, okay, because you name the strain after your own initials. Like there's an MLC strain, a gluten metabolizer, MLC169 that breaks down gluten, okay. So that's named after my, my initials. And so there's Jeff Hillman. And I, when I first heard about this, I, you know, being in education and teaching all these years and all these different, so many students at different you know, institutions, I was so excited, you know, I called up Jeff Hillman, talked to him. So please, because I've always gone to the research meetings and seen stuff on strep oralis and strep uberus and strep ratus right there. So it is generally regarded as safe, like all, all these probiotics, you can't get sick from it. You can't hurt anyone with it, okay? These are perfectly safe probiotics, but they're effective, not just in my study, but other studies too. They mentioned the 15 peer-reviewed studies there. And it reduces the production of lactic acid, the streparati does, so you get much less decay, but it also inhibits all the pathogens. And this is a classic one from Jeff Hillman years ago, he gave me this slide, actually, on experimental design, where they took plaque from a periodontal site and they uh, uh, dispersed this in, in buffer and grew it out on a plate to see the individual colonies. Took those individual colonies, stuck it in a plate of agrobacter, and saw what the inhibition was from the regular bacteria in that patient's mouth. And it reminds me of the infamous, I shouldn't say infamous, it's really a great study on the study they did on E. coli, remember this one on E. coli, where they took this really bad E. coli and they sprayed it on people's hands, and they had you hold it up like for an hour or two, and then you put it in the auger, and they have other people do like two or three hours, they put it down. The longer the E. coli was on your hands, the more it died, because of your normal commensals were killing the E. coli. Remember that famous study? So it reminded me of that, very much so. And so what the results were is a healthy mouth will greatly inhibit the agrobacter. These are colonies, and these colonies turned out later on to be like strep orla, strep uberus, and they were killing the agrobacter. So what causes disease is a lack of good bacteria. That's what causes disease. Health is caused by the presence of good bacteria. So that's what prevents disease. And see here we have the KJ3 right there, you know, killing all around it the agrobacter because it produces hydrogen peroxide. So it changes the environment on a microenvironment level so that those pathogens, which are strict anaerobes, can't live. And then, of course, they also did the research showing that that changes the biofilm like we have talked about before. All this bulk fluid goes through. And there's tons of articles on this which are going to be hard for you to see because of the projector. But here's Sigmund Sokransky's in 1992. This one goes back to 1988 by Jeff Hillman and others right here. Here's another study, 1988, 1985, 1980. So all these have been studied and published in top journals for decades. What is taking us so long to start to adopt probiotics as what we should do? What's taking so long? We should be adopting these products. So that's the take home. Probiora has decades of research backing the product. Most products have no studies. BioGaia has 160 by 130 peer reviewed ones. So there are products that are well studied. There are products that aren't well studied. So just be careful what you buy, definitely. You should have a protocol in place before you get started. A protocol in training. Your team should be 100% on board. Go back Monday, sit down with them all, say, hey, I went to this thing on dental probiotics. We need to get started on dental probiotics. Our patients need this. We need to prevent heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, everything else. We have to get started. Okay, thank you. Oh, God, she bought me for sugar. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I'm the sugar addict. She gives me sugar. Pump that in my veins now. Thanks. So, anyway, and use something for testing. Measure your success. I use the CAMX Spectra. You can use your diagnodent unit. 
And later on, you'll be using some really up, upscale type things. Now, the problem is probiotics without prebiotics is smoke without fire. And I love that expression, smoke without fire. And it's because you give them the probiotics, they go home and eat this. You're not feeding the bacteria. What happens, you can go home and get yourself 100 beautiful, cute puppies and put them in a room with a little glass of water and walk away for a week. What's going to happen? That's what you're doing to your probiotics. They have to be fed. That's why I like kefir, because you feed them as you consume, consume them. So, yeah, smoke without fire is a classic expression used by, you know, Duke of Wellington at Waterloo when Marshal Ney attacked the English squares with cavalry and no infantry. Infantry was supposed to follow, but didn't, and that's why England won that war of 1812 and France lost. And Duke of Wellington said, cavalry without infantry? That's smoke without fire. So it's the same thing. Exact same thing. So I do a lot of this for myself. I haven't had a curious lesion restored since 1976. I sat for a senior dental student who was not going to be able to take his boards and take his army appointment unless he could do one more gold inlay. I had this little tiny, tiny inner proximal. And I said, go ahead and let him do it. And the board said, we can't let him do that. That doesn't really need to be done. I said, no, I want it done. I'm insisting. And so he did this inlay on me, this gold inlay, so he could get his, his army position. So that was like 76 or so. So that's, but here, this because you have the right bacteria, right? So active cultures, a lot of them, and also it's loaded with tryptophan, which is great for behavior change. And that's why you see the studies on anxiety, depression, right? And kefirs, which I'll show you some real quick. Probugs. I like this, frozen kefir for kids. You go, you see that in the freezer at your grocery store. I tell the parents, summer days they come home, they have a pro bug, right? Right, Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, give them that, your probiotics that way too. Skin probiotics, this product should not work. This should not work at all. All the wrong bacteria, right? Those are gut bacteria. What are they doing in the skin spray? You know what? It works. Isn't that funny? I don't know why that, that product should not work. It does not make any sense at all, but for some reason that product works. A lot of people have a lot of improvement. This doesn't work, but it's very expensive. It's sold at Bloomingdale's. They say they have colloidal silver in it as an antimicrobial, and they say they have probiotics in it, which is kind of like, they don't list what, but it's very expensive, 75 bucks, so that's okay. I mean, people will buy it. As Mark Twain said, never argue with stupid people. They will drag you down to your level and then beat you with experience. <laughs> so when people buy that for 75 bucks, I just go, okay, go ahead. I'm not gonna argue with you, right? And there's probiotic toothpaste, too. This is a great probiotic toothpaste made with lactobacilli uh, paracaceae, which is made by Bassif. They, they grow it, they pasteurize it, and they sell it as proteaction and they add it into toothpaste. It's so good it made the front page of the Journal of Dental Research February 2010. That's lactobacilli paracaceae co-aggregating with strep mutans. Even though it's, pasteur even though it's pasteurized, the, the structure of it is it adheres to strep mutans and prevents it from forming colonies. It's a really good toothpaste. Right there, there's a great article published. There's the original container. That's what it looks like right now, periobiotic. And that's used with, um, has xylitol in it too. So you have your prebiotic and you have your probiotic. It doesn't matter that's pasteurized. We use a lot of periobiotic in the office, especially with disabled kids. Really works well. I'm gonna skip the movie. There we go. Um, is there some caution? There's been very, very few rare cases of sepsis with probiotics. There's like two publications or three now, I think, talking about, I'm busy, sorry. <laughs> Take a message. <laughs> and so what needs to change is people have to understand that there is a possibility. There's one case out in uh, Japan, in Tokyo, a guy ate only a probiotic yogurt, massive amounts. That's all he ate for like weeks, and he got sepsis and died. 
So people do stupid things. But if you want to read a really good article on a review of probiotic therapy in preventive dental practice by Mark Cannon, it's published in Probiotics and Antimicrobial Proteins. Up there published, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, know. I don't see the date, I don't remember either. Probably 2011, 2012, but that's the journal of probiotics. It's right there, the Probiotics and Antimicrobial Proteins, a review of probiotic therapy and preventive dental practice. So you have to kind of know what you're doing. Um, probiotics are constantly forgotten about, even though they have an unbelievable history. You know, this article came out in Journal of American Dental Association, it carries in a Medicaid population, no mention of probiotics. No mention of xylitol, nothing. And yet probiotics were made so famous in World War II in North Africa. This is a, the famous Bacillus subtilis story. And my youngest son, when he went to uh, NYU, in his first class, he had in biology, uh, the instructor got up and said, well, I gotta tell you the Bacillus subtilis story. And my son burst out laughing and immediately called me saying, Dad, he called it a classic like you do. And I go, well, it's a classic story. So in, the, in North Africa, the Africa Corps on Aramo was suffering horrible casualties, death by dysentery. But they noticed that their Arab allies did not have any problems because once they started to get sick, they ate camel dung. You grab some warm camel dung and you would eat it and it would save your life. Now the German soldiers would rather die. <laughs> and they did. And so they airlifted some camel dung to Germany. This is 1940. They isolated from it Bacillus subtilis, which is a bacillus, that spores, that lives in the ground. And that's what comes in from the outside with your dog. That's why dogs make you so healthy, because Bacillus subtilis is brought in, and they, brought, they came back with Bacillus subtilis as a capsule for the German troops and saved thousands of their lives, only to lose them at Alamein anyway. So um, anyway, that's a Bacillus subtilis story, and you all have had it. There's not a person in here. Is there a person who hasn't had chicken at one time? Okay. Chicken now does not have antibiotics. You know that. Purdue and Tyson all say, everyone, never, no antibiotics ever. That's because the EU forbid, they, they pass a regulation against importing poultry that had, had antibiotics. They want to lose their sales. They give them Bacillus subtilis. And every chicken has Bacillus subtilis. That keeps them healthy. And if you go talk to the people at the... Uh, uh, Department of Agriculture, they'll tell you about what a wonderful thing it was to bring back Bacillus subtilis 40 years later for animals. Keeps them so healthy. Good enough for chickens, not good enough for people. Although they do put in pizza, though. Biogen, you've heard about them, they put Bacillus subtilis because they'll survive up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you slow roast a pizza, you can keep your, your uh, probiotic alive. Prebiotic fiber is a non-digestible fiber, which isn't really true because a lot of times it is digestible if you have the right bacteria. And that is what is necessary to support bacteria in your large intestine. Remember, that's prebiotics were being defined as supporting bacteria in the large intestine. That's something we have to get away from because there should be prebiotics for the skin, for the hair, for the ears. You know, earwax is a very important thing. It protects you from infection. It probably encourages the growth of good bacteria in your ear. This crazy stuff out there, just crazy stuff. That's really great. So there's more prebiotics right here. They did the definition. It's oligosaccharides. They support the good bacteria, and that confers a health benefit on the host. So what is a good oligosaccharide? Well, you have your fructo oligosaccharides. You have the galacto oligosaccharides, like you do with all your dairy products, like cheeses and so on. But there's inulin. There's asparagus. There's onion. There's uh, Certain tomatoes, bananas, all sorts of things increase the growth of your bifidobacteria. And that is all prebiotic. You got your asparagus, you got your tomatoes in there, you got another prebiotic, you got your galactoligoside in the cheese. So that is a giant prebiotic thing. One of the reasons why people could actually eat unhealthy yet be healthy. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a massive prebiotic. 
It's incredible, right there. Again, who does all this stuff? Well, you know, it's my team. By the time I walk into a room, carry screen has been done on a carrier's prone child. They already know about Probiora or BioGaia, depending on their age. They already know about xylitol. They already have been told, time to use a xylitol mouth rinse. You have to get your five exposures a day. Da, 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 da. I just confirm everything. That's my job. So team members always be coming to OSHA and learning with everyone else, right? And of course, you know, bears are kind of an embarrassment, although they're doing much better this year. At least one thing is I'm not a Packer fan. <laughs> Come on, I knew there were some Packer fans here. That's why I did it. Had to do it. That's my family, and that's the kids right there. Uh, old, old picture, but my favorite picture. That's when my middle son got commissioned as an officer by my oldest son, who read him the rights of office. That's my oldest daughter, who is a psychologist up in Minneapolis, but right now she's just raising Henry. Um, youngest daughter is a pediatric ICU nurse, was, did a residency at Vanderbilt, now she's at Minneapolis Children, and youngest son who is, uh, writes algorithms and he's a, a theoretical mathematician at uh, King's College. These are old pictures, by the way, but uh, that's middle son, Bagrin, right there, and uh, um, I could tell you all sorts of stories about Bagram and about FOB Shank. And the best way not to get heart hurt or broken is pretending you don't have one. Charlie's Chin, you definitely proved that case of not having a heart, right? So anxiety depression, um, just a few minutes on this. Uh, everyone now knows, of course, anxiety depression is due to lack of neurotransmitters. You're very low on neurotransmitters. There's been fantastic studies done on anxiety depression. And it's one of those things where my good friend who was head of psychiatry inpatient at Children's Hospital, James McKenzie, said once a group like this, I had him as a speaker, he's a great speaker, he gets one of the biggest frauds in history was Freud. This stuff is all nonsense about your relationship with your mom, all this stuff. Most all this stuff is your neurotransmitters are off and they're off because you don't have the right bacteria. And there's like probably a hundred studies out there now on it but this one was a great one. This was published in Gastroenterology. And what they did, they took three groups of women and without any issues whatsoever, one group had a kefir, the other group had just a milk product without bacteria, another group had nothing. And they did emotional brain tasking and they did functional MRIs. And it was a phenomenal study because they really showed that it, they could show there was a big effect on the emotional brain tasking by the use of a probiotic. It is incredible, the research that's been done out there on this. That's why kefir is an ultimate superfood right there, but will probably never ever replace having a glass of wine with your BFF. <laughs> and you've seen all these articles, probiotics may one day be used to treat depression. Well, it is being used already. This is a famous Leiden study. Right here, eight species, they put 20 volunteers and 20 controls without, with, a, with a fake probiotic. They did all this cognitive reaction to sad mood studies, and they showed, hey, yeah, actually, omnibiotic really works at preventing anxiety depression. Great studies like this, and, and this is the American equivalent, it's Probilin. When I talked to the people who make this, they said, yeah, they copied that. Okay, this is a German product you can't get here. And then I know all these psychologists and therapists now, they all have their patients on probiotics. I had one of my employees who was always on Xanax and we weaned her off of Xanax, much to her psychiatrist's chagrin, and she hasn't needed it because she uses a probiotic. So again, if you have the neurotransmitters, and we could go on all the research for days on that, Alzheimer's disease, we mentioned that a little bit already. This is what I was mentioning about striatal enriched tyrosine phosphatase. This is from Yale a few years ago, showing that there was this bacterial virulence factor. They were gonna to try to block it with a chemotherapeutic agent. Why block it? Why let it happen? Because I saw that striatal enriched tyrosine phosphatase, I said, I recognize that from this article from before. And it comes from, unbelievably, that comes from porphyrmonas gingivalis and strep gargani 
When those two grow together on a bed, they produce striatal and rich tyrosine phosphatase. How do you prevent that? Yeah, we talked about already. Very sensitive to polyols. Very sensitive to erythritol. So that's how you prevent inflammatory Alzheimer's. Now there's multiple Alzheimer's, as everyone here knows, at least three distinct types. Now one is due to a significant zinc deficiency, right? You've heard all the research that's been done on that one. And that is basically what you eat too. Like oysters are very high in zinc, but if you go to one of these foo-foo places like Susan Maples goes to, <laughs> that, that where they serve it like Mexican style oysters on top of corn tortillas, see what happens to your zinc? Zinc is so important. So, you know, all this stuff works together. All of it works together. NED and dementia. If you have erectile dysfunction, you tend to have airway issues, you have cardiac disease, you have also periodontal disease, and you're far more likely to develop dementia. When are we going to understand it's one disease? And this is awful to see this because how cruel can you be giving a guy ED and then removing his ability to remember the good old times? <laughs> I mean, life is cruel and unfair and that is a fact. That is really, really bad. And of course, autism, you guys know, I've been involved a lot with autism research which we won't have time really to go over. So let me see if there's something really quick. And I apologize for taking too long talking, but there's so much stuff in autism. Let me just go up to cardiovascular disease. I think you guys are seeing all the research and all the stuff on the animal studies with autism, how we can create autism in, in animals and all that with propionic acid and it comes from the gut. We have all this great validation research now too. And this is just some of the stuff we did with uh, xylitol and erythritol, getting rid of the autism bacteria associated with it, and C. diff. And this was huge with C. diff. This is actually we got the Nobel form to invite me the first time was the stuff of C. diff because they, I was lecturing up in Canada, the Canadians started to use it, then the Australians started to use it, then they claimed they invented it, but everyone knew it came from our research project about erythritol and xylitol preventing death of C. diff. We could just, it, it just 10% would greatly reduce the growth of C. diff, and it's such a big burden, C. diff, that you know, we have half a million cases, 29,000 deaths, and that's how I ended up there at the Nobel Forum and everything. So I'll just go through that real quick. Let's get here, epigenetics, so on. Um, we have all this great research I wanted to cover. At, we have this new Simpson query as a short chain fatty acid. It was huge because they no longer produce propionic acid. And if you've heard me speak before, the strep mutans that you see in kids with autism is completely different from strep mutans you see in other kids. And the strep mutan strains in autism, they produce, instead of producing lactic acid, produce propionic acid. And propionic acid is a very strong brain irritant. It is just hugely hardened on the brain. And here's all the research on that and all the other things. Now, one thing real quick here too, is you can diagnose autism in a child, an accuracy of 96.3% by taking a salivary sample and looking at the microbiome. That's how specific the microbiome is for autism. And so when we talk to people about autism, we talk to them about the microbiome, we're talking about a lot of the studies that we have coming up that we're working on to modify that microbiome. And it, their depletion of certain Prevotella is so important. And so one of the ways you can prevent that, of course, is actually with erythritol. And K.K. Makinon showed that a long time ago. Oh my God, that study was what? Um, I don't know, it's like 2000 or something like that, 1998. I, I don't remember. But it was a great study. And it really showed that you could reduce the level of propionic acid. And so we're doing all these other studies. I just want to show you one right here. Um, this is one of my clinical studies I'm working on. We ran out of money. I always tell people, money and time, we ran out of money. I ran out of time on lectures, I ran out of money in research. So I, that's what my life is all about. Uh, we lost some of our funds, they went to a NASA project instead, which was a really good NASA project though. But we're looking at two populations, like I mentioned, 
population in the United States, population in Cuba. We actually have the support of the Cuban government. The Ministry of Health has authorized us, if you can believe this, to go into rural Cuba, to look at the microbiome, to look at their mitochondrial health, and we don't have money to do it. Is that insane? And then I see all these studies given $3 million, $5 million, and all I'm sure is like $30,000. I mean, it's totally insane. I almost want to take another loan in my house. That was a joke there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, again, the microbiome is what produces things. That's my grandson when he was really little. See how cute he is? He's such a cute little guy right there. So take homes on this, shift in the microbiomes. They do happen. You see them with all sorts of autoimmune disorders like autism and so on. Okay? Allergies also, but we're going to skip over that because of time. And uh, I always plan way too many lectures. Oh, great studies, by the way. This is from Lancet. Um, you probably heard about the peanut thing. We do it in Northwestern now. Peanut allergies are being treated and they're getting rid of them. Yeah. You know, you've probably heard about that. Northwestern's doing a lot of it. Children's Hospital's doing a lot of it. We're just growing like a weed, getting rid of peanut allergies. And you can do it by exposing them to probiotics and peanuts. See that? Probiotic. It's a lactobacilli aromosis. And I got rid of two of my own allergies using the Murdoch. I was really sensitive to pineapple and coconut. Do not give me a pina colada. Okay. <laughs> I can eat pineapple like no tomorrow. No issues. You don't have to have allergies. They are not necessary. They're perfectly treatable. 80%, then they followed up on four years later, they're still all okay. Four years after complete treatment and is safe. So that's why the, this whole treatment of probiotics and allergies. People say probiotics don't work. Throw this in their face. It's huge being done everywhere in the country, right? Allergies are due to dysbiosis. Family again. Oldest son, Afghanistan, before going out with 101st Airborne. Middle son married, officer's wedding, with my daughter-in-law cutting the cake. When you got his wings? Right there. That's my dad as a cadet. There's my oldest son. See, the, the, the family resemblance just stays there forever. Oldest daughter at her wedding. And right here, one last thing, just for fun. We're going to skip obesity, unfortunately. I love this fiber study. This is amazing to me. World Journal of Gastroenterology. I love this so much because they looked at these different institutions, looked at people coming in who had chronic constipation, and they noticed that all of them had already been on a high fiber diet. They go, wait, this doesn't make sense. Eat more fiber. And people go, I, I, all I eat is fiber. Okay. And so what they did was they divided them in randomly in three groups, and they told one group, eat more fiber. The other group, just eat what you've been eating. Okay. Third group, no fiber. Guess who got better? No fiber. So my youngest son had problems with this, and he got off the fiber kick, no problem. It was the fiber to begin with. And it's all microbiome driven, 100%. So uh, with that, and we don't have time for obesity, which I'd love to cover with you guys, because there's so many things with obesity that are just phenomenal, recent stuff. And as you know, I always add stuff that just comes out, like, you know, like last week and so on. So again, please um, visit with Peter. Are you here? See that guy in the back? That's Peter Maroon. If you have questions on Probiora, okay, go back and visit that guy. I have three more boxes to distribute right here. Okay, so let's see here. Let's, okay, wait, if I throw it back there, you promise not to get hurt? Okay, you promise? Okay, here it goes. No, sorry. There we go. Oh, did you block it? Shame on you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, okay, here we go. Here we go. There we go. So anyway, I'm all out. I'm all out. Thank you so very, very much. We have announcement here. Wait, wait, one more thing. Don't leave, don't leave. We're having too much fun. Go see Peter. But wait, two seconds. Uh, this is attached. I have to get really close. <laughs> I'm Susan Maples, and on behalf of our entire board and all three organizations, we're delighted you're here. We didn't really do a proper introduction. It's lunch, and across the street in the mall, there are lots and lots of um, choices for lunch. We'll be back at 1 o'clock. Wasn't he great? A round of applause. Oh, thank you. And, and the CE code is... 
and the CE code is PP432. We hope also, so PP432, we hope at the end of the day you'll join us for our welcome reception and um, we'll have some probiotics and prebiotics. We'll have some micro beer and red wine there for you. Okay, great. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Everyone, thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't mean to run over. I know you have to go eat. So have a great, great lunch. And uh, vary your diet. Diversity, diversity. Thank you.